Go, my heart. Go to heaven. There is no rest on earth. In the burning of the Republic, it is always the flattened mountain that performs the first act of self immolation. 
then the shacks. Too close. A mouth with too many teeth jostling for attention in protest of their own impoverishment. And the people within, the people within them follow. And artwork in schools we can't afford. And burning schools burning because we have nowhere to learn. Fire in the peripheries we've been relegated to. Queer black bodies spinning on the tip of a candle flame. Borders incinerated, and no one loses cattle and Bibles and prayer beads and hymn books aflame. For those in the coordination with the modalities of war and worship, who follow the fire and study incineration, it is not alarming at all. The gods have begun to appear at their own places of worship. They step off their gilded thrones, descending on billowy sheepskin clouds. They lower themselves, escondered in light and always blare in horn and forlorn shrills and toots and booms. They hide themselves in the blaring, repudiating their light for hours. It is not alarming that the gods are knelt down in supplication at their own altars. They have begun to pray to themselves, prostrate at the feet of their own effigies. They have begun to pray for themselves, sacrificing their own truths, chanting under their breaths. We need new hymns. We need new psalms. We need new people. We need new hymns. We need new psalms. We need new people. The country is simmering. Whispers in the deep have become a raging in the light. Machetes and hammers are aimed at inanimate statues. Buses ablaze. Libraries crumble, crumble into ash. There is no value in the promise of the future when promises no longer suffice. Gods become irrelevant, impotent, when we possess the power to pray our own devils back to the hell.
peace. Uktula. Skele uktula na pekai. Skele uktula na pekai. Yes, it works. Thank you to The Brother Moves On and uh, to Yahima Piedra. This was just a prelude to our two days of invocations. We will introduce The Brother Moves On later as they will have other interludes and they will have a performance uh, later in the evening. But now we want to briefly accompany uh, in the program of the, these invocations because we are especially happy to welcome you today for this madness of the, the invocations of ultrasanity. I have to read this time because this message is uh, a little bit personal and so I feel a little bit vulnerable and I prefer to read. So. Uh, as we always mention, um, we are together in the Kupelale for this experience uh, um, of our discursive and performance program. Uh, but we are in this particular room uh, and we always feel that together we need to invoke, convoke and evoke spirits, uh, but also paths uh, and encounters uh, that we wish to be as much transformative as uh, unexpected. The journey started uh, 10 years ago when Savi Contemporary was founded by Bonaventure and Dikung. This was when our madness uh, began, our insistent to th insistence to think and act against the grain and our belief in uh, outrageousness. 10 years after, and I had the pleasure to witness and participate to the unfolding of Savi since uh, 2012, we could say that uh, making Savi possible was an ultra-sane idea. Um, not an insane, but also not a very sane one. Um, instead, as uh, Monica Greco uh, proposed, it was somehow an outrageous proposition one of these propositions whose lure is to offer a springboard for the imagination of different possible futures, as she put it. Today, Bonaventure is, is not present. He had to take care of a person in transit somewhere else uh, in Cameroon. He's not here, but I need to call his presence uh, um, and mention that his vision was in many ways uh, ultra sane. He was alerted by people about the difficulty of his endeavor, and he was suggested a few times to scale down uh, uh, some of his insane plans. Nevertheless, uh, he was hearing voices, uh, um, voices that uh, he had to follow. And when we expanded into a wider collective body, we also chose together to continue hearing <laughs> these voices and to enact uh, this ultrasanity. It is for this reason that this project is, is very significant, I would say, for us uh, at SAVI. Ultrasanity and our fundamental, and I would say even foundational, interest and focus on healing through community engagement represent, in fact, a perfect opportunity, a perfect lens through which to analyze 10 years of activity, 
retrospectively and prospectively. It also offers us a, a good metaphor to talk about the madness, again, the ultrasanity of our structure and our interest in engaging with analysis and self-analysis in addressing self-critically the structures and the infrastructure that we are, are creating because we consider ourselves a sort of a para-institution in constant becoming and in constant transformation. Okay, I missed now. Uh, when, we, when we started this project on ultrasanity uh, last year, it happened that my, my father suddenly passed away. He was a psychiatrist, or as I actually prefer to name it, he was a cosmonaut of the psyche. It comes without saying that most of the reflections uh, that I faced and elaborated in the framework of this project are stemming from uh, the time that I spent with him, with his interlocutors, uh, his words, uh, and the thing that I learned from him, and the thing that I wish I could have spoken about, like, like this one. When, when he passed away, Bonaventure immediately called me to say that we should have dedicated this project to him. And of course, I was uh, very humbled, especially because I missed the opportunity of thanking my father for all the sensibility, sensibilities and the knowledge that he uh, shared with me. Now, uh, at the end of the project, it happened that also Bonaventure's father passed away. He was an anthropologist, a rhythm anal analyst, a wordsmith, a narrator, as Bonaventure uh, told us, a kind reader as well, who donated many of his books to, to found our Savvy Doc. He was somebody that deeply inspired us, not only in the creation of Savvy Contemporary, but also for this very particular project. So uh, it was really a strange twist of fate that brought us both in, in this same position of having to pay tribute to our janitors in a way that we would have both liked to have done in a different way, uh, differently, with them still among us. Today, and I think that we are in the right space to do that, here in this morning room uh, uh, of a former crematorium, I would like to invoke the spirits of these fathers and to dedicate this project to, to both of them. I, anyway, also want to dedicates the project to other such inspiring souls, uh, and not secondarily so, to the whole Savvy team, as it takes a whole team to make ultrasanity. <laughs> it takes a whole community, a community of ultrasane people uh, that are willing to be in this boat together. So together with our people, our guests, uh, and together with you here today, we will attempt uh, to reflect on ways of challenging hegemonic therapeutics primarily based in uh, Western ethnocentrism, those therapeutics that disregard healing the healing possibilities of collective, mythic, and historical narratives. For that reason, we will pay attention exactly to this collective ima imaginary and imaginative powers and these mythic narratives. We will listen to those voices that follow us. And we will perform and embody uh, struggles in all their intersectionality. In a disruptive way, we will also address our nevrosis and confront our paralysis, perhaps. But we will create space for healing through community engagement and through collective care. We already had a workshop yesterday with children also trying to uh, go in this direction with Eva Kotatkova at Kifa Gallery. Kifa is actually uh, the collaborator, uh, our collaborator in this project and, and is hosting the second half of the exhibition. And this morning we had another workshop with the, uh, the Stimmenhoren Netzwerk, uh, the network of hearing voices, uh, and together with Dora Garcia. 
Um, but maybe I want now to call Kelly uh, on stage to tell something more about ultrasanity. But I also want to mention that uh, the, program, the program is rich, what we wrote is also a lot, but everything is on paper, so you not, you're not going to uh, get lost. Uh, you can follow everything there and you will find lots of materials here and there. So um, the spirits, I think, also are with us, especially after <laughs> the, the prelude by The Brother Moves On. Thank you, Elena, for speaking so beautifully about the project at large and the personal interrelations of it. I will speak briefly because we have a very fueled and large program for the day and not so much time since we're running it slight late. But I will say that we're very excited to have you all join us into the realms of the ultrasane. Thank you to Bonaventure and to Elena who led this year-long project so beautifully and piercingly and to the savvy team at large as always for working magic in ways that always go beyond the expected givens. In ultrasanity, we move beyond the binary of the sane and the insane. We queer conceptions of normalcy and understand madness as a language, questioning the society that labels, stigmatizes, and often represses individuals rather than switching the gaze upon itself as an environment that often produces the injustices and violences that can cultivate mental and emotional distress. Healing is also a vital question. Healing methods often ignored or erased by Western science, which do not always give credence, very often, not at all, to catharsis, art, community, expression, non-normativity as mediums for generative potential, and languages that speak to our wholesome, personal and collective narratives. We first began in during the Venice Biennale, working with practitioners and critiquing Western and limiting psychiatric models. We went then to the Ganawa Festival in Esawira in Morocco, where ritual, music, trance, community, and healing was investigated through the scope of the Ganawa tradition. We then turned to the Mumbashi, where sanity and segregation of the colonial histories therein were put into question. Berlin is our culmination, and we welcome you into this ultrasane land um, giving space to our incredible multidisciplinary participants now who will shine a light on their perspectives on madness, healing, and the queer zones of the spectrum of the self and of the collective. Before I invite Urban Farrell, sorry. So our first presenter, performer, is Urban Farrell. And I will read briefly about them to invoke their joining us. So Urban Farrell combines imagery, field recordings, and fossilized frequencies from post-war Iraq. They layer visual documentation with sound waves as a way to heal broken paths of lineage and resurrect the ethereal weight of their ancestral heritage. Urban Farrell states, where art has become a saturated market of business and capitalistic artistry, Urban Farrell is an outsider who uses vernacular aesthetics as a subversion of ambition and professional status. Urban Farrell plays with the ethereal space of bodiless consciousness, returning art to a spiritual activity where one can access parts of the psyche repressed or marginalized by the socio-political conditions of contemporary life. Layering image, resonance, field recordings, and interviews as a way to heal broken paths of lineage, she communicates a diasporic narrative. So, the, okay, first yes, Elena. Now also, we uh, have to remember always to thank our supporters and our founders. First of all, the TURN, um, fundings from the Kulturstiftung des Bundes, that are since years supporting the work that we do at Savi, but also all the partners of the project, IFA Gallery that I already mentioned, the Association of Neuroesthetics, um, the Gnawa Festival in Esawira, and Picha Lubumbashi. So thanks to all of them, even if they cannot maybe hear us. Thank you, thank you, and we welcome Urban Farrell.
Sorry, Sorry folks, folks about, about the light. The light. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
هو الميت رب العالمين يقول احسن شيء تنطيد كل الله يرحمه الرحمه تجي تبرد مكانه بالحر تبرد مكانه بالشتاء تدفي مكانه تذكر بالخير فغير هاي ماكو فغير هاي ماكو فغير هاي ماكو فغير هاي ماكو
Okay, um, so our next participant is going to be Ajani. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ajani Okpu Egbe, and uh, who's going to be in conversation with one of our Savis, Arlet Louise Ndakose. Uh, Ajani Okpu Egbe was born in Kumba, Southern Cameroon, also known as Ambazonia. He lives and works in London, the United Kingdom. Using a crude, expressive, painterly language that incorporates autobiographical content, Ajani unfolds a wide range of complex themes relating to archaeology, feminism, patriarchy, African history, Pan-Africanism, Afrocentricity, the African diaspora and political activism reflective of and transcending the Southern Cameroon's Ambazonian movement to highlight specificities within the realm of the global social justice movement. These are sometimes spiced with direct and indirect senses of humor that give away his interest as a keen observer of people and a social commentator. I'm reading an excerpt, and uh, it's titled Uncle James. If you feel a little bit confused, don't worry. It will come full at the end. So, Uncle James. It was almost midday, and the sun was overhead. It shone brightly over his shoulders and casted a contorted silhouette of himself on the foreground of a deserted market square, where during the market days would usually be full of women, men, boys, and girls selling fresh vegetables, smoked fish, plantains, cocoa yams, cassava, and a variety of fruits. The figure approaching the from the south entrance of the market square instantly evoked feelings of someone who was emotionally disturbed and physically impaired as its lanky, ghost-like frame seemed to struggle to carry its own way. Clenching a half-smoked cigarette in his left hand and a bottle of beer in the other one, he staggered forward and stopped right in front of a gutter which was almost full of muddy running water with loads of floating debris, including plastic bags, pieces of clothes, and small sticks. At the far left end of the gutter, a few ducklings could be seen and heard squawking in between synchronous movements as they submerged and emerged their snake-like necks in the stream, simultaneously splashing water everywhere. With every splash, followed by the release of a stale smell, reminiscent of fermented sweet corn, but obviously without the sweetness. He stood there for a few seconds, and gently moved his head sideways from left to right and then 
forward and backward, as if under instructions, he was performing a physiotherapy exercise. After what seemed like a moment of hesitation, he finally gave in as he lifted up the bottle and started drinking out, for, out of it. One could hear the noise made by the drink as it burrowed its way down his trough with every gulp. After a few gulps, he took the bottle out of his mouth, took a, a deep, satisfying breath, looked up, and cackled, hooray, hooray, hooray. Then he took a few steps backward and attempted to jump over the gutter, which was less than a meter wide. Thus, enormous stride will have sufficed for him to cross over. That turned out to be a bad decision as he fell over, flat on his face, his body unevenly spread on both sides of the gutter. Groaning in pain, he tried to stand up, but instead fell into the gutter, making a splash. He lay in there quietly for a few seconds. Then, like a worm venturing out of its burrow, he squirmily tried to propel himself forward, still holding tight to his bottle of drink. One could tell he was in so much pain. Uncle, 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 the terrified voice of a little boy, presumably eight or nine years old, echoed from an unconcerned nearby gathering as he meandered through them and made his way towards the man in the gutter a few meters away. The man recognized the voice instantly and slowly lifted up his head to reveal blood oozing from his mouth and nostril and dropping on the ground. By this time, the crowd nearby, which was composed mostly of teenagers, had begun to gather around the scene, forming a semicircle on both sides of the gutter. Their attitude was strange, as they didn't seem to move or to be moved at all by what was unfolding right in front of them. They just stood there, some with their hands in their pockets, others folded their arms, and in akimbo, the rest fixated their gaze on the injured man as they whispered to one another. Then, suddenly, one of the teenagers moved forward, stooped over the man's body, and started tending to his wounds with a piece of cloth he took from his pocket. Just at that moment, an adult voice invaded the scene. Wait till it happen, wait till it happen for here, he shouted at the top of his voice, in pidgin English. His voice and the tone subdued those of the whispering teenagers as they make way for him to walk through the crowd towards the injured man, still being tendered by the teenager. Once he got there, he asked the young man to move away. By this time, the teenager had already solicited for the support of two other boys, and together, with the little boy we had earlier addressed, the injured man uncle, they had managed to lift him out of the gutter and lay him vertically by the side, face up. Bad luck, bad luck. I feel self say, na some better man. When not only this mad man make wuna gather for years so. He retorted dismissively in pidgin English after recognizing the injured man on the ground. 
Una all go for una houses. He continued, asking the teenagers to leave the scene because it wasn't worthwhile attending to a madman who has chosen the path of self-destruction. Reluctantly, they all left one after another. And in less than five minutes, the scene was vacated. But for the injured man, the little boy, and the intimidating adult who, who was meant to be helpful. Again, in Pidgin English, he questioned the little boy's presence. Wait till you did still do here. Now my uncle, I know to go anywhere. The little boy replied defiantly saying there's no way he will leave his uncle there by himself. Okay, I see, said the man. In that case, go house and call your papa and I go look after him till Wuna come back. Asking the little boy to go and get his dad or a relative while he look after his uncle. The boy hesitated, saying that his friend, Walter, left earlier to inform his parents. But if you go by yourself, they go believe you and go come here quick, quick, and take your uncle to hospital. The man persuaded, saying that it will be taken, it will be taken more seriously if, the, if he, the little boy, had done that by himself instead of asking someone else to do so. The little boy didn't trust the man, but nodded his head and dashed off quickly, causing thick brown dust to rise behind him as his little feet hit the ground one after the other. As soon as he made his first bend round a dilapidated, a dilapidated building nearby, he slowed down, stopped, and looked back at the scene, and was shocked to see the man searching his uncle's pockets, removed his wallet, and opened it. Instinctively, the little boy immediately sprinted back towards the scene, and as the man fumbled to put the wallet back in his uncle's pocket, he kicked him on his left side so hard that he, the little boy, fell over the man and sideways into the gutter, causing a big splash that frightened the bathing ducklings out of the gutter. The man stood up, looked round furiously. No one was watching him. No one else was there but for the three of them. So he walked aggressively towards the little boy, grabbed him by his left arm and pulled him out of the gutter. You small devil, I go teach you lesson today, he said angrily, promising to deal with the little boy, literally squeezing the words out of his mouth as his hands fumbled over his trousers, revealing a black leather belt with huge buckles dangling on one end. By this time, the little boy was screaming, envisaging what was going to happen to him next. The man folded the belt in halves, and with both edges facing downwards, he lifted it ferociously in the air. A few hours later, he wake up in a hospital with his hands handcuffed by the side of a bed. Mr. Eta, I am Inspector Martin, and this is my colleague, Mrs. Chair. A smartly dressed police officer break, through, break the silence and introduce himself. You are under arrest for suspicion of causing grievous bodily harm to two individuals and robbing one of them. You are advised to stay silent. Anything you say might be used as evidence against you in a court of law. Do you understand? 
Mr. Eta closed his eyes and nodded his head, seemingly in disbelief as he tried to recollect what happened. While he was flogging the little boy with the belt, his uncle had slightly recovered, stood up, and pushed Mr. Eta with all the force he had left in him. Mr. Eta had fallen over and banged his head on a brick which was lying on the other side of the gutter. He had been on the ground unconscious for a while before being rushed to the hospital. The little boy's uncle was also being treated at the same time in a different ward in the same hospital. A few hours later, his uncle died and the little boy lived to tell the story but wanted out of that community immediately. I was that little boy. And what I just read to you right now was a nightmare I had when I was nine years old. The following day, my life will change forever. I was moving to a bigger city to live with my dad. Little did I know that a new chapter in my life, an autobiography was about to start. Little did I know that one day I will be telling this story. But hey, here we are. Okay, in, in real life, my uncle who is actually of late now was a skilled hunter and a generous man who had issues with alcohol. He always made food for me and my elder sister when we went to his house. He taught me how to climb mango trees, open coconuts, and how to detect kinds of animals by their footprints and the path that they create in the bushes. One of my earliest drawings at the age of nine at the age of eight, sorry, was of my dog called Valley, a hunting Labrador watching my uncle skinning a rock python he had brought back home from one of his hunting adventures. Unfortunately, I will never see him again as he died a few years ago after battling pneumonia for a couple of months. Our precious moments are still fresh in my mind and I will always cherish them. Everyone in the community knew my uncle as the madman, the alcoholic, and whatnot. But I spent a lot of time with him in his farms, and he was a totally different person once he was in that realm. Absolutely sober, alert, with keen attention to details in everything he did. I came to understand that he was a solitary man by nature. And getting drunk as soon as he was back in the community was his escapism. And there were personal reasons for that behavior, which I came to find out later. I'm the only one who got to see the two sides of him and putting one and two together and now believe his alcoholism was self-medicating. As an artist and a researcher today, documenting aspects of sanity and insanity, I have finally come to conclude that Uncle James was actually practicing madness. And he thought those who chastised him were the ones who were truly insane. Uncle James wasn't mad, he was ultra sane in a mad world. This, this is an excerpt from my autobiography, which is in progress. It was first written between 15th and 21st January 2015, four years before I was to participate in ultrasanity on madness, sanitation, anti-psychiatry, and 
resistance. On another note, <coughs> Adolf Hitler only succeeded because his ideas in Menkaf came across as madness. That wasn't achievable. Initially, no one took him seriously, especially the German intellectuals at the time who ignored Hitler. He went ahead and caused the death of millions of innocent people around the world. Not only because he was evil, but more so because the good men stood by and did nothing until it was too late. Our collective responsibility is to shed light on these issues and actively organize to pressure policymakers and hold those in power to account for both what they say, what they do, and what they fail to do, whether it is in, here in Germany, whether it is in USA, Britain, France, and their shameless exploitation of foreign policies in Africa. Their action as innocent lives are destroyed in the conflict between Cameroon and Ambazonia is shameless. Their action in Syria is shameless. Their action in Yemen is shameless. Their action in Congo is shameless. Just to say a few, but I really wonder where the Boko Haram from Nigeria get their weapons from. Their weapons are really sophisticated. They are not made in Nigeria. It is not doing something is enabling the most gruesome crimes against humanity. As Dr. King puts it, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I met and spoke with um, Professor Fred for the first time yesterday, although I've been introduced to his work by Bonaventure um, months ago, and he actually emphasized that when you get there, make sure you meet him. So yesterday was a really special day for me. And uh, I hope we understand all, as Professor Fred Hicklin would put it, understanding is good, overstanding is better. Thank you. Thank you. So the conversation I think is not any more needed because this was a conversation between you and your uncle, you and your reflection. So uh, I thank you very much uh, thank for you. that. Thank you. So Ajani is actually one of the participants of our exhibition. So you can see uh, his paintings downstairs. And another one of, uh, of our artists that are both participating to the exhibition and contributing to these invocations is Alessandra Eramo. Yes, exactly. Ooh. <laughs> so. Alessandra will take us into a, an archaic sonic territory inspired on the tarantella music and dance. Uh, um, in the piece uh, that she has downstairs, she is al also, she's also presenting recordings of songs uh, sang by women uh, in Puglia. But in this uh, more hypnotic performance, she will accompany into she accompany us into uh, other territories. Uh, we will, she will also allow us to think through uh, hysteria, I think, and uh, other ways in which madness has been uh, gendered. So briefly, as uh, we do with everybody, we also introduce uh, our contributor uh, properly. So Alessandra is a Berlin-based sound artist, vocalist, and composer. She creates performative works and installations using voice, sound, and text, felt recording as well, video and drawing, exploring Latin acoustic territories of the human voice and noise as such a political matter. Blurring the line between performance art, it's good that I talk because they are 
uh, installed in, so you can actually read also the bio in, uh, in our handout. Uh, blurring the line between performance arts, experimental music, and sound poetry, the essence of a practice is to destabilize the normal expectation of the voice to trance, uh, a new, to trace, sorry, a new sense of beauty and sound of language. So um, I could mention all the festivals where she took part, all the radio projects, all the exhibitions, but I have to admit there are really many. <laughs> So it's probably better to uh, read it yourself uh, if you if you wish in into our handout. So welcome, Alessandra. Delay. 
ante pizzichi le caruse mienzulanche pizzichi le caruse mienzulanche Fimmene, fimmene, che ciò di aluta bacco, de già di doi, e ne tornati a quattro. Cibula dice con piantati lo tabacco, la ditta non butai li taraletti, capoli sordi, bulli benedico, bun decattati e noci di Natale. Te dico sempre quando pianti lo tabacco, lo sole è forte e ti lo sicca tutto. Fimmene, fimmene, che ciò di alle aulie, cugliti nelle fitte e li cigliare. Fimmene, fimmene, che c'è di avvendignare, e sutta lucipune e bula faciti fare. E santo Paolo mio di lutarante, pizzichi li carusi a mienti ullanche. E santo Paolo mio di discursoni, pizzichi li carusi a li cuglioni.
Let me count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten.
Ja, ich wollte nur kurz warten. <laughs> um, before I introduce um, our next participant, um, also just a few uh, personal words about how special um, this program is in, again, helping you understand in another frequency, in another rhythm, in another way, something you've been thinking collectively um, about for quite a while. And I think this program this project um, that has unfolded um, through this year, at least for me, opened my eyes again in how many ways it is important to break the world a little bit open in putting burdens on individuals and how to rethink responsibilities in a collective way. Um, so in a, in a, let's say, mad world or society, how can every single one be responsible to carry that burden of holding up in this world. And I think this is one of the many important things in this project. So I want to thank the curators, um, you know, for helping us think through these things again. Um, and I think also this project, although it is a new field that we did research in and, and, and developed um, collaborations, very much ties into what we always interested in our projects. Um, and one stream of that is how to handle the trajectories and, and continuities of violences that are not yet passed. And I think in that realm, I would like to introduce um, the next um, participant in the program by first reading a sm small part of one of his poems. I am the Palestinian Syrian Swedish refugee wearing Levi's jeans invented by a Jewish immigrant from Germany to San Francisco, filling my camera with pictures like a Russian peasant woman filling a bucket with milk from under her cow, nodding my head like someone absorbing a lesson, the lesson of war. Gayat al Madun is a son of madness, born into the violent, the absurd. To parents forced out of Palestine and into the Yamuk refugee camp in Damascus. Maybe in this condi condition, he could only become a poet, I would argue. He could only become a poet when the world I itself exceeds the imaginable. Gayat follows and feels for the revolutionary in his poetry. Poetry then becomes a way to endure, to resist, and to wonder again, and I quote again, will I survive this time? Will I be able to write something new? And like always, I punch the world in the face and continue writing. Please welcome Gayat. Good evening. So it's the studio. Oh, I, I have my computer, so I don't know. So I close this. Yes. And I will go here, yes. And then. So thank you for the invitation. I will uh, read four poems. The first one from my German book. I don't know the title. <laughs> and uh, it exists outside the, in German and in English and in Arabic. And then I will read two new, po two new poems. They are really fresh. So I end them this month. So you will be the first people will uh, hear it. And then I will end uh, with another poem from my German book, uh, but it's a poetry film. I make it together with the Swedish poet Mary Silverberry, which with her I wrote a poetry book and make five uh, films. I wish you good luck with Arabic.
كيف أصبحت شاعرا سقط حزنها من الشرفة وانكسر أصبحت تحتاج إلى حزن جديد حين رافقتها إلى السوق كانت أسعار الأحزان خيالية فنصحتها أن تشتري حزنا مستعملا وجدنا حزنا في حالة جيدة غير أنه واسع قليلا كان كما أخبرنا البائع لشاعر شاب انتحر في الصيف الماضي أعجبها الحزن وقررنا أخذه اختلفنا مع البائع على السعر فقال إنه سيعطينا قلقا يعود إلى الستينيات كهدية مجانية إن اشترينا الحزن وافقنا وكنت فرحا بهذا القلق الذي لم يكن في الحسبان أحست بفرحتي فقالت هو لك أخذت القلق في حقيبتي ومضينا مساء تذكرت القلق أخرجته من الحقيبة وقلبته فقد كان بجودة عالية وبحالة جيدة رغم نصف قرن من الاستعمال لا بد أن البائع يجهل قيمته وإلا ما كان ليعطيناه مقابل شراء حزن رديء لشاعر شاب أكثر ما أفرحني به هو أنه قلق وجودي مشغول بحرفية عالية وفيه تفاصيل غاية في الدقة والجمال لا بد أنه يعود لمثقف موسوعي أو سجين سابق بدأت باستعماله فأصبح الأرق رفيق أيامي وصرت من مؤيدي مباحثات السلام توقفت عن زيارة الأقارب وازدادت كتب المذكرات في مكتبتي ولم أعد أبدي رأيا إلا ما ندر صار الإنسان عندي أغلى من الوطن وبدأت أشعر بملل عام أما أكثر ما لفت انتباهي هو أنني أصبحت شاعرا Before I came to the AD residency, I was in Amsterdam for six months, and I hear the people say that uh, the Dutch government announced that the war in Syria is ended. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this very new point, so they are only translated into English. لو كنا في عالم افتراضي انتهت الحرب لقد انتهت الحرب لكن القنابل لا زالت تتساقط داخل رأسي لو كنا في عالم افتراضي لكنت مسحت زجاج النافثة المطلة على بيتك بجريدة إلكترونية ولنمت الوردة البلاستيكية التي وضعتها على قبر أخي انتهت الحرب والأصدقاء الذين ذهبوا إلى السوق كي يشتروا موتا طازجا قتلوا في الطريق لو كنا في عالم افتراضي لكنت أعدت تدوير أصدقائي فأنا بحاجة لأصدقاء مستعملين انتهت الحرب وعاد القتل إلى أهلهم سالمين عاد الشهداء إلى أمهاتهم كاملين عادت الأمهات إلى البيوت عادت البيوت الشوارع الجوامع الأعين الأقدام الأشلاء إلى أصحابها عادت الأصابع إلى الأيادي الخواتم إلى الأصابع المدارس إلى الأطفال عادت حبال الغسيل إلى الشرفات العشاق إلى الأساطيح أخي إلى أمي وأنا عدت إلى دمشق لو كنا في عالم افتراضي لنسيت أن أتذكر الحرب ولتذكرت أن أنساها 
كما ينسى القتلى ملامح الجنرال وكما يتذكر الشهداء الطريق إلى البيت انتهت الحرب وأصبح جميع من عرفتهم ميتين أو مجرمي حرب أو مجرمي حرب ميتين لو كنا في عالم افتراضي لأطفأت الحرب كما تطفئين التلفزيون ولكننا ولدنا في عالم ابن عاهرة وحين يولد الناس في عالم ابن عاهرة يتحول الزمن إلى آلة كاتبة والقتلى إلى قصائد هامش كوميدي تكمن عبقرية دانتي في الليمبو تأملها قليلا وستدرك فورا أننا نعيش في أولى طبقات الجحيم قطع اثنين الحرب حاولت أن أترجم لك الحرب من لغة سامية إلى لغة هندو أوروبية فأصابتك الشظايا حاولت أن أسعفك فحاصرتنا نشرة الأخبار حاول مجلس الأمن أن يرسلنا أسلحة ذكية فصادرها رجال أمن متوسطو الذكاء شتمنا الصليب الأحمر فاعترض الفاتيكان أكلنا لحم كلاب منزلية قتل أصحابها فاعترض أنصار البيئة نجونا من الغرق فاعترض اليمين الأوروبي كيف يمكن أن أصف لك كم يشبه هذا العالم ضربات الأيدي الهزيلة على الجدران السميكة لغرف الغاز في معسكرات الاعتقال دون أن تصابي باضطرابات ما بعد الصدمة كيف يمكن أن أشرح لك الفرق بين عبيد المنزل وعبيد الحقل دون أن تختلط عليك سوريا والسريالية كيف يمكن أن أقول في قصيدة واحدة قتل أصدقائي تحت التعذيب وأنت أجمل من نيويورك دون أن يضحك لوركا في قبره أو أن ينفصل الشعر عن الواقع هامش تراجيدي ليست مشكلة هذا العالم أن ربع سكانه يذهبون إلى عيادات الأطباء النفسيين المشكلة أن الباقين لا يذهبون قطع ثلاثة شطرنج عندما مرت الريح لم تجد الشجرة وكانت الفأس تنظر نحوي وأنا ضائع في الترجمة هادئ مثل وقف إطلاق النار عالق في كوكب أزرق في ضاحية نائية من مجرة درب التبانة رأيت غزالة تفترس ذئبا وكان الدم ينقط من أسنانها رأيت نساء عواقر يرضعن أجنة ولدوا ميتين رأيت ذبابا إلكترونيا يخرج من تويتر ويحوم حول جثث أصدقائي رأيت بلدا يركب في قارب صيد ورجلا يأكل لحم أخيه ميتا ليس مجازا كما ورد في القرآن إنما رجلا يأكل جثة أخيه الذي قتل في القصف كي لا يموت جوعا مرت الريح ولم تجد الشجرة لم تجد المدينة لم تجد البلاد للكلاب كانت تعوي ولا القافلة تسير زوجة الأرملة تنظر نحوي والحرب نظيفة وكأنها شطرنج أسعار براميل النفط تصعد وبراميل التي ان تي تهبط على المدن والطائرات تلحس الكتب المدرسية وترضع أصابع الأطفال وأنا صامت مثل مواطن أوروبي يتمتع بامتيازات العالم الأول ويتساءل ببراءة ذئب منزلي أيهما أصعب الشتاء السويدي أم الربيع العربي هامش عبثي النيويورك تايمز تقول إن الحليب أبيض بول سيلان يقول إن الحليب أسود أمي تقول لا يوجد حليب
قطر أربعة مجاز عاح خارج من عالم افتراضي كان دانتي على حق إن هذه الكوميديا التي نعيشها إلهية أو لكي نكون منصفين فلنقل أنها إلهية بنسبة 97% على الأقل وإلا كيف تفسرين أن كل ما حولنا يشبه مجازا خارجا من عالم افتراضي الأزهار تمارس الجنس عن طريق النحل أدولف هتلر كان نباتيا نحن سعداء لأن الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية لم ترمي القنبلة الذرية على طوكيو المؤيدون للدكتاتور يخرجون بمظاهرة تطالب بمنع التظاهر أنا أحبك الله يبيع الأراضي المليئة بالحليب والعسل فنلندا أسعد بلد في العالم حسب تقرير السعادة العالمية الصليب الذي تضعينه في عنقك ما هو إلا آلة تعذيب رومانية هامش تراجي كوميدي بما أن الجميع سوف يموت في النهاية فإن نسبة الموت في سوريا والسويد واحدة قطع So the, th the third the poem, it's uh, really new, it's written with this. It is about the uh, Evian conference in 1938 in the city of Evian, in the border between France and Switzerland. So, uh, history repeats itself, as uh, Karl Marx say, and the second time it is a comedy. I hope you will notice with me now. في السنة الماضية على سبيل المثال للحصر توفي قارب محمل باللاجئين بسكتة قلبية حين وصلت أول سفينة إلى مكان الاستغاثة كان البحر الأبيض المتوسط قد غرق تماما وجدوا الماء مختنقا وجدوا الأمواج مبللة بالمياه وجدوا الاتحاد الأوروبي يحاول أن يتعلق بقطعة خشم من بقايا القارب لكي ينجو لم يجدوا الأطفال نتائج التحقيق الأولية أشارت بشكل واضح إلى أن صور الأقمار الصناعية قد أظهرت أن القارب الغارق لم يكن يعرف السباحة في نشرة أخبار الثامنة مساء وبينما كانت مياه البحر الأبيض المتوسط تسيل بهدوء من التلفزيون إلى الأرضيات الخشبية في غرف الجلوس مسببة ارتباكا بين العائلات السعيدة في البلاد الآمنة ومحدثا اضطرابا من الدرجة الثانية على الأداء الجنسي للأغلبية الصامتة في وسط وشمال أوروبا وبطريقة مباغتة تشبه نمو الفطر في الغابات تساءلت سيدة أوروبية من الطبقة الوسطى عن سبب مجيئهم عن طريق البحر وليس بالطائرة بعد حصولهم على الفيزا لشدة البراءة البيضاء انتحر التلفزيون في تعليقه على الحادث المأساوي قال مسؤول الاندماج في دائرة الهجرة في اتصال هاتفي ماذا سنفعل الآن؟ لقد ماتت الشحنة الجديدة من اللاجئين الذين سينظفون خراء المتقاعدين الأوروبيين العجائز في نشرة أخبار الثامنة مساء قالت مذيعة بيضاء لم تنجب أطفالا من قبل نقلا عن متخصص بشعون الشرق الاوسط لم يزر الشرق الاوسط من قبل ان الاطفال ربما قد يكونوا اختفوا لاسباب ما بعد حداثيه حين كانوا يلعبون الغميضه عيسى بن مريم 
كان الناجي الوحيد وجدوه يمشي فوق وجه الماء هامش واحد سيسرقون وظائفنا وبيوتنا وسيغبون نساءنا سيستحوذون على الموارد التي خصصناها للفقراء وسيتسلل بينهم المجرمون والجواسيس تدفقهم سيزعزع الاستقرار وسيؤدي إلى تفكك المجتمع مظهرهم سيء وينقلون الأمراض معاييرهم مغايرة وثقافتهم مختلفة وأخلاقهم غريبة ولن يستطيعوا الاندماج هامش اثنين جميع الكلمات العنصرية التي وردت في هامش واحد لا تحيل إلى أزمة اللاجئين الحالية كما يسمونها والتي يقصد بها اللاجئون السوريون في هذه الأيام إنما استعملت على نطاق واسع من قبل وسائل الإعلام الغربية لوصف اللاجئين اليهود من ألمانيا والنمسا الذين حاولوا الفرار من النازيين في فترة ما قبل الحرب العالمية الثانية هامش ثلاثة في عام 1938 اجتمع 32 بلدا في مؤتمر إيفيان لمناقشة أزمة اللاجئين اليهود من ألمانيا والنمسا رفضت الولايات المتحدة زيادة الحصة السنوية للاجئين حتى قبل بدء الاجتماع بريطانيا صرحت إن المملكة ليست بلدا للهجرة جميع الدول رفضت استقبالهم بتاريخ 13 يوليو كتبت جريدة الحزب النازي فولكشر بيوباتشتر بنبرة المنتصر لا أحد يريدهم لدي إحساس داخلي أن الذي كتب المقال هو أدولف هتلر شخصيا بعد أربعة شهور من نهاية المؤتمر قام النازيون بليلة الكريستال ثم بدأوا تدريجيا بحل المشكلة اليهودية بطريقتهم الخاصة التي انتهت كما نعرف بالحل النهائي So the last poem, it's written in 2012. I didn't know in that time that I will come to Berlin to leave him. And I made the film with Marie Silkbari in 2014. The poem is very long. And uh, only this small part of it. كنت أبحث عن الفرق بين الثورة والحرب عندما عبرت رصاصة جسدي أعيد إعمارها مثل برلين يكمن السر الذي يعرفه الجميع وهو أن ال... لا لن أكرر ما هو معروف لكنني سأخبركم بما لا تعرفون ليست مشكلة الحرب في من يموتون مشكلتها في من يبكون أحياء بعدها <تصفيق> هذه المدينة أكبر من قلب شاعر وأصغر من قصيدته لكنها كافية لينتحر الموتى دون أن يزعج أحدا ولتزهر إشارات المرور في الضواحي ليصبح الشرطي جزءا من الحل والشوارع مجرد خلفية للحقيقة 
لقد بعت أيامي البيضاء في السوق السوداء واشتريت منزلا يطل على الحرب لقد كانت الإطلالة رائعة لدرجة أنني لم أقاوم إغراءها فانحرفت قصيدتي عن تعاليم الشيخ واتهمني أصدقائي بالعزلة وضعت كحلا على عيني فازدادت عروبتي وشربت حليب الناقة في الحلم فصحوت شاعرا كنت أراقب الحرب كما يراقب المصابون بالجذام عيون الناس ولقد توصلت إلى حقائق مرعبة عن الشعر والرجل الأبيض عن موسم الهجرة إلى أوروبا وعن المدن التي تستقبل السياح في أيام السلم والمجاهدين في أيام الحرب عن النساء اللواتي يعانين الأمرين في أيام السلم ويصبحن وقودا للحرب في أيام الحرب لقد كانت أجمل حرب خطها في حياتي مليئة بالمجازات والصور الشعرية أتذكر كيف أنني كنت أتعرق أدرينالينا وأبول دخانا أسودا كيف كنت آكل لحمي وأشرب صراخا كان الموت بجسده الهزيل يتكئ على ما اقترفت قصيدته من خراب ويمسح سكينه من ملح وكانت المدينة تفرك حذائي بمسائها فيبتسم الطريق وتعد أصابع حزني وتسقطها في الطريق إليها الموت يبكي والمدينة تتذكر ملامح قاتلها وترسل لي طعنة عن طريق البريد تهددني بالفرح وتنشر قلبي على حبل غسيلها الممدود بين ذاكرتين وأنا يشدني النسيان إلي عميقا إلي عميقا فتسقط لغتي على الصباح تسقط الشرفات على الأغاني المناديل على القبلات الشوارع الخلفية على أجساد النساء تفاصيل الأزقة على التاريخ تسقط المدينة على المقابر الأحلام على السجون الفقراء على الفرح وأنا أسقط على الذكرى تماما كما لو أنك تأكل أصابع حبيبتك تماما كما لو أنك ترضع سلك الكهرباء كما لو أنك تأخذ لقاحا ضد الشظايا كما لو أنك لص ذكريات تعال لنمسك عن الشعر ونستبدل أغنيات الصيف بشاش طبي وقصائد الحصاد بخيطان العمليات الجراحية اترك مطبخك وغرفة الأطفال واتبعني لنشرب الشاي خلف أكياس الرمل إن المجزرة تتسع للجميع ضع أحلامك في السقيفة واسق نباتات الشرفة جيدا فقد يطول النقاش مع الحديد اترك خلفك جلال الدين الرومي وابن رشد وهيجل واجلب معك ميكافيلي وهنتنكتون وفوكوياما فنحن نحتاجهم الآن اترك ضحكاتك وقميصك الأزرق وسريرك الدافئ وهات أظافرك وأنيابك وسكين الصيد
Sorry. Uh, we will survive. Don't worry. It's not. It's not very important. أزرق وسريرك الدافئ وهاتي أظافرك وأنيابك وسكين الصيد وتعال. ارمي عصر النهضة واجلب محاكم التفتيش. ارمي حضارة أوروبا واجلب ليلة الكريستال ارمي الاشتراكية واجلب يوزيف ستالين ارمي قصائد رامبو واجلب تجارة الرقيق ارمي ميشيل فوكو واجلب فيروس الإيدز ارمي فلسفة هايدجر واجلب نقاء العرق الآري ارمي شمس هامينغوي التي لا تزال تشرق واجلب رصاصة في الرأس ارمي ليلة فانغوخ المضيئة بالنجوم واجلب أذنه المقطوعة ارمي جورنيكا بيكاسو واجلب جورنيكا الحقيقية برائحة دمها الطازج نحن نحتاج هذه الأشياء الآن نحتاجها كي نبدأ الاحتفال Thank you so much. I cannot say anything. We have a break, 10 minutes break. Thank you. Thank you, Gayat.
Jamaican. Here comes a rude boy Jamaican. Bread in the yo. Bread in the oven, bacon. Here comes the rude boy.
being with us. So uh, the first uh, Sonic Prelude and all the coming contributions are from himself in a bit and Yahima. And uh, all these contributions actually are from himself's mother's and father's hymn book. And uh, just to give you a small insight into this uh, process of the Ultra Sanity series. So basically two years ago we wrote a bunch of artists, hey, do you want to come on this journey? And they said, yeah, sure, send us our, the letter of intents. And with uh, The Brother Moves On, we had this conversation over two years. And then four months ago, I email, I have the Skype interview with Sia Bonga. Okay, let's do this. And then, ah, okay, I don't know. I'm the only one with the Schengen visa. The other ones, they need to have a visa. And then we couldn't figure out with the dates. And at the end of the day, we said, okay, let's have Nolan. Let's figure out with the Goodman Gallery to uh, have the visa rushed, didn't work out, and we said, okay, let's have a visual artist from Berlin. Lerato uh, said, okay, I'm happy to do it. Lerato didn't have time. I need a piano <laughs> player who's based in Berlin. I said, oh, I know one, uh, Shannon. And Shannon said, hey, I'm happy to do it. But, oh no, on Saturday I have a baby shower, uh, but I have a friend, Yahima. And at the end of the day, we said, my God, we really want to make this happen. And we want to have the brother moves on, but in a way, a way the universe is like against it. I said, Lily, just book Siabonga's ticket. Let's have him. We're going to make it happen. And so yesterday when finally I uh, picked himself up and we had this uh, conversation during breakfast, like he said, you know, in a way I thought, what does the universe want to tell me? Like, maybe I shouldn't be afraid to be alone and... On another note, uh, himself's wife is um, Zangoma, and I shared, I said, hey, I believe in these powers, but in a way I'm afraid, you know, when a Zangoma woman looks at me. And he says, do you know when she looks at you, it's not only her looking at you. And I want to invite you to think about the presence and the truth that ideally the brother moves on, that are with us right now and their ancestors. So please help me to welcome again Sia Bonga himself and Yahima. Thank you so much Thank for being you. with us. My family doesn't believe in death. My family believes in passing. My brother, who was literally my twin, passed about five years ago. When my brother passed, my niece walked up to me and said, Uncle, are you sad? I said, yeah. I would have said I'm broken, but she would have never understood. Are you sad because uncle left? Because uncle died? I nodded my head. My fairies die too. And when they die, I never see them. From that, from that pain and that conversation, this song was sent to me. Lullabies for the Dispossessed, part two. On grief. And she said, Uncle, I believe in her. 
life in an ever-growing world Uncle, I believe in a thing called love And she said Uncle, I believe in a thing called love And a thing called life in an ever-growing world Uncle, I believe in a thing called love. I will love you forever. If that is what you need. Through the good times. What you must remember is that life is not linear. The societies that are dispossessed seem to understand that. Life is circular. We move on to planes. We look after our own, not having bodies.
mother and the child the mother and the child the most affected by all of this the mother and the child capitalism deals in us in all the same way we're all black women we're all black women in the weight of it all so if you separate your politics from black women's politics doomed and people seem to think that black woman and child might be the weakest in the situation but they're the strongest they're the strength we draw from they're the essence we draw from because we're all black women at the end of it in our pain in our suffering in our searching for black fathers we're all black women. We are 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 all black women. Positive energy activates constant. Elevation, peace, Uktul, still Uktul. We pray for peace in all these spaces. Amen. Next up is um, Leo Asimota, who doesn't want to be introduced and has carte blanche. It's Leo! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we need some time. Wait. 
This is one of Father's night. We have a special treat in store for you. It's a composition dedicated to all mothers. And it's titled All the Things You Could Do by Now, a Secret for His Wife is Your Mother. That's uh, four fingers. <laughs> okay. I can be here. Okay. You'll be here, right? Actually, Leo and Abby. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, no, can we give him the microphone, actually? <laughs> 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 All right, uh, the, the text. Yes. I, uh, we're going to begin with this text, but I'd like for you to indulge me. Uh, you are going to read it, uh, hopefully in the chorus. Um, I've timed this text already before. It's about three and a half minutes long, so I hope you have breath. Uh, if you fall in and out of chorus, it's great, but there should be a unison in terms of the reading of the text. But there's also a challenge. You, you're going to have to read louder than the song, I will be playing alongside it. And this song is important because it's, it's basically what the text is based on. It's what actually inspired the text uh, by uh, an African-American writer called uh, Hortense uh, Villas about psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis and race. Okay, the song. Yeah. And now, ladies and gentlemen, one of Father's night, we have a special treat in store for you. It's a composition dedicated to all mothers. And it's titled, All the Things You Could Be By Now, Sigmund Freud's Wife Was Your Mother. Which means, if Sigmund Freud's wife was your mother, all the things you could be by now. It means nothing. You got it? Thank you. One, one, two, three. <laughs>
indulging me. And um, this is my first indulgence. There'll be another one later. But uh, on a serious note, uh, I'll use this uh, opportunity to talk about how I got uh, invited to contribute to, to Ultra Sanity and how that whole uh, period began. It involves a lot of people, funny enough. Uh, uh, Bonaventure, of course, uh, initiated the, the invitation. But as a result, there's also another artist. Um, his name is Nashio Moskit, uh, who got involved at the very initial stage uh, at the, in the makings of the project. Uh, we, were, we had come to Berlin last year and I, in preparation for an exhibition in, in Frankfurt. And we had come to see uh, Bonaventure to talk about uh, a book we were working on for the show and how uh, we would like for him to, to write a piece for the catalog. It was there and then he talked about Ultra Sanity and we're talking um, Fourth of September, two thousand and eighteen, um, and he was still fleshing out the ideas for this for this project, and we begin to talk about ourselves, myself and Nastio, our own anecdotes of of um, the insane, and I'll try to to paint three portraits of people that I know. Uh, one is an aunt, another is uh, someone who could have been a friend. And the third is a stranger who I encounter on a day-to-day -day basis or irregularly at times between my home and my studio in London. But this gist with Bona was so invigorating that, that uh, we began to talk about uh, different stories uh, or, or outlooks about the uh, madness on the insane in our respective places of origin. I am from Benin City, born in Nigeria. And Nastio is uh, from Angola, and Bonar is from Cameroon. So, but with, within this triangle of the three of us having this conversation, we had we found similarities. Uh, but another thing occurred to me in that conversation is that that those that are mad or insane have a quality that those of us who are not uh, live by: shame and pride. They lack it. It became very aware to me at the time that those who are in this qualification of the insane that I've encountered in these cities, in Benin City for sure, have no shame or pride. Um, but I'm jumping ahead of myself here, and I'll talk about my own sense of shame from a position of pride in regard to someone that I know who uh, found to be insane. But fast forward to London uh, in October 2018, uh, the lecture Bonaventure gave at Goldsmith, and that's the first time I heard about the, the ultra sanity uh, with the anecdotes and the uh, aspirations for the project. And soon afterwards, on the way back to the airport for him to board a flight to, to Berlin, um, I told him, I said, you know, there's an album by Ravi Shankar uh, called Transmigration Macabre. Uh, about a, it's a soundtrack to a movie uh, called Viola. And it's about a, a man who was possessed and, and believed that his dead wife was following him, but she was a cat. And uh, knowing him, he, he loved it. And I said, I'll send him the, the album. The fifth, I think, the fifth song on that album is actually called Madness. And that will be the first, or rather the second song I will play uh, in this attempt of mine to create portraits of people that I know who are mad or insane or quite simply who have the nervous disease. But from all these conversations that that we were having between October to, actually again October, a year later, uh, when I saw him again in London. We were already talking about people like Emil Kreppelin and whole diagnostic cards that brought about uh, 
the categorization of these nervous diseases. Uh, Eustafe Bellin, uh, a Haitian slave who on a trip with his master to America, uh, the ship was, was uh, ransacked and held captive by uh, pirates. And in that attempt, he uh, actually saved his own master. Uh, years later, he was celebrated, especially uh, in Europe, in, in, in France, where there was a, um, a phrenological head of his that became, um, was studied. So within all this, we begin to accumulate uh, narratives and possibilities for the show that, that we are experiencing at the moment. But talking about cats, and wives, and I'll go straight to the first portrait I hope to paint of my aunt. Uh, her name in my language makes a lot of sense. In the adult language, uh, in Benin City, makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I remember her so well, and the last time I saw her was in 1986. She's still, she's still very much alive, but I haven't seen her since. So in a way, maybe it's a portrait of two aunts that I'll be painting. One that I know, and one that I continue to hear about, as a sort of rumor, according to uh, Shade Marianne Olaoye in the poem downstairs on, on madness. And also more, she's more a mythological figure for me now because of the rumors. And, but I begin to also identify the qualities that I know she has that has transformed into this other being that is now being thought to be mad. Growing up in Benin, I was one of her favorite uh, nephews. Uh, that had its benefits. Uh, because she really was a, a raging beauty. You saw her, you wanted to take possession of her. And she knew it, too. And she also knew how to use this scent of hers to bewitch, to a point where she was actually quite wicked with it. But nevertheless, uh, loved with a kind of commitment that I still do not understand whether from her siblings or to her male suitors. And then in 2016, 30 years after I left Nigeria, I went back for the first time and I was quite keen to see this aunt of mine and everybody Nobody wanted to talk about her. Not my mother, not my cousins, uh, but I egged them on for this narrative about this woman and, and it became one of fantasy and fantastical stories. One day she was pregnant and then a week later she had given birth to a fully grown walking kid. Uh, but I insisted on going to see her so they took me to her home. And this is where I begin to realize that maybe she has her senses with, with her because her home became really fortified. High fences, you cannot see in, fully gated walls. Uh, you couldn't even see the house that the fences were uh, protecting because it was so high up. Uh, and nobody knew whether she was in or out, and she would often appear. I was a little consoled when they still refer to her as still being very pretty, how fine she really still is. Uh, these are the neighbors who every now and then they meet her, they encounter her and uh, say, you've come to look, she's your sister, my aunt. Wow, we haven't seen her in a while, but my goodness, she still is a fine looking woman. I'm also quite keen to see this child of hers, uh, and whose child it perhaps 
the child belongs to, or is this a different kind of uh, immaculate conception? It's possible. Um, but I still don't know, and I'm yet to see my aunt. Her name is Itoha. And it means to show mercy or to have mercy. So I'll play you um, the first song that Na uh, Bonaventure and I exchanged called uh, Madness by Ravi Shankar. Second portrait I shall attempt again is uh, of uh, a young man I know. Um, if you bear with me, there I'm trying to make a, uh, I'm finding the connections between time and, and crossings. I've subtitled the thing as crossings. I left Nigeria in 1986, and that same year. In London, I bumped into a, a friend I went to school with in Benin City on a high street in London. Uh, I think we both went into the same fast food joint to get a burger. Uh, and there he was and there I was and as typical of people who are from the same place and find themselves in a foreign land, there was jubilation. Um, we thought it was ridiculous that even though we, do, we both want to eat out, you decide to pay for yourself, whereas you pay collectively when we go, as we, we know it in, in Nigeria, you go out to eat together, one person pays. You don't, you don't pay, and uh, it didn't make any sense. Uh, and as a result of that encounter on the high street in London, uh, we, we remained friends. Uh, uh, he had come here to become a pop star had said about becoming that, literally. The process is not new. You go off, make a series of demos, and send it to an A&R &R man or woman, and hope that they think your song will make them a lot of money. And as a result, you become famous and make even more money. And he had a good voice about him. He could sing. Um, I don't know about the songs, but he could sing. Um, and then 
out of all that, within a year of, of this encounter in London, I didn't see him again, neither did he, he never saw me again. I moved, I don't know why. I can say I moved houses, he moved houses, I really don't know why. Or maybe we just became bored. I didn't have any aspirations to be a musician or a singer for that matter. Um, or there were no commonalities, no shared interests, other than the fact that we knew each other, went to the same school in Benin City, and here we are in London, uh, trying to forge a friendship, which we never had at home in the first place. But nevertheless, a few years ago, this century, on a very certain spring morning, it was a Saturday, I remember vividly, because I was going to, to a, a, a market in, in, in North London. Um, I had come out of a train station called a Finsbury, no, Highbury and Islington. And this train station, this is at, is, it's the beginning, at the beginning of a very major thoroughfare in London called the Holloway Road. It is believed that you can take this road all the way to Scotland, uh, but busy. I haven't tried go, going to Scotland on it, but so they say. Uh, and I, as I step out of the station, and there's a gentleman on the floor in a deep, intense conversation with no one but himself. And at first, I, you know, you take a, a shot, you look, and then you look, and then you look. I looked again. I realized that it's this boy, man that I know, and that's why I mean about the shame and pride. Um, because I was shameful. Huh? So he has one up on me, if you like. He has none, no shame or pride. But I was shameful in the fact that. My shame came out of the pride that I know him, but not in the way that I found him. And in a way that it was my shame, if you know what I mean too. I don't know what has become of him because I tried going back to that train station, but I've also come to realize that the insane are quite nomadic. Um, at least those who are not uh, in mental institutions, that is. Um, you see them in one place, there's no guarantee you see them again in that place. Or they are ramblers, if you like. Um, they go from place to place. No one and nowhere is familiar to them. I could be wrong, but this is my observation. And that would bring me on to the next song. It's, from, it's by a Ghanaian musician called Dennis Dawson. And it was a song that was made in the 20s in England. Uh, it's from an album, compilation album called Living is Hard, Migration in, in Great Britain between 20, 25 or 27, I think. And I felt that this song said the most I could ever say about him. <laughs> Yabu, <laughs> Uh, 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 uh,
The third portrait is of a gentleman I encounter every so often on the Holloway Road in London. Um, He's one of many or a few people who populate the Holloway Road that might be thought are insane or uh, I'm yet to find uh, an asylum in that area where, whether they escape, because every now and then you see them on the street and all the times you don't see them at all. Some are beggars and other times they're very well dressed sometimes better than I am dressed today. Uh, and I wonder what states and where they have, I, I can't quite figure it out. But there's one character that I have exchanges with every so often. I have seen him uh, really impoverished. All the times I've seen him on his way to work or looks like he is in a suit and tie with a, with a briefcase. But at all times, he seems to be in a hurry. I've never seen him taking a stroll. I've never seen him casual. He seems to always be in a haste. Tall, slender fella. He's not English. Neither is he West Indian. Every now and then he might say to me, Salam Alaikum. So either he thinks I'm of the faith or I look like I could be. Happens regularly too, but, but I think that's his faith. Um, light skinned, never really that disheveled, but always in a hurry. Well, the reason why I, I bring him to this conversation is because he connects to my trip to Frankfurt, to the exhibition that we were staging in Frankfurt uh, in 2019 last year. And that trip from Frankfurt to, London, to Berlin to see Bonaventure about ultrasanity. 
because that particular trip, I had seen him on the street again in a hurry. And we were on opposite sides of the street. And he yelled at me, you must carry on if they are paying. And actually, I actually went to Frankfurt to negotiate my fee for the exhibition. <laughs> uh, I couldn't really ask him what he was, he just said, brother, brother, you must carry on if they're paying. <laughs> and, and he was gone. I, I smiled and I carried on walking and then only found out I was going to Frankfurt to negotiate a fee for, for an exhibition that took place. But if there's a curious thing about the, this area that I, that, I, that I inhabit, Holloway, Finsbury Park, Highbury and Islington, there's an interconnection. It's almost like a, a Z from Finsbury, from Highbury and Islington Station, Holloway Road, Seven Sisters Road to Finsbury Park. And it's a very dynamic neighborhood. There are universities there. There is, uh, the other end is quite affluent. And then this center point, this L junction with Holloway Road and Seven Sisters is where the action really is. Uh, there's a lot, always a lot of sirens, whether it's police or ambulance or fire services. Uh, and then up to the top towards Camden is what used to be a women's prison that's been shut down now. So it, it just really is a very vibrant neighborhood. Uh, full of immigrants too, and that's also why I begin to notice that a lot of the, the not necessarily homeless who might have a, a, the nervous disease, a lot of them are in these neighborhoods. Often I find them on the street, sometimes disheveled, other times under medication. Uh, maybe then that's when they are abnormal. Uh, but I'll end with a very recent encounter with, with this gentleman uh, at Finsbury Park Station. I saw him on the platform and he saw me. And our eyes locked and he looked away. And when the train came, he went into a different car. I still don't understand that. So, my last indulgence is a song I'm going to play. I think it's really apt. Uh, it's by uh, a musician called, a guy called Gerald. Song is called Life Unfolds Its Mysteries. This indulgence is for you to dance. Like seriously. this. You say you're going to indulge me, right? How do you make this louder? How do you make this louder? If I start dancing, this is not going to be over. Can we make it louder?
on it, man. Thank you, Leo. I'm a little bit out of breath, but I just want to remember you that the title of the song was uh, Life Unfolds Its Mysteries. So let's uh, remember that. So I want now to introduce, but very briefly, um, Elizabeth Babakamba Tambwe, uh, who is going to perform a piece called Abstraction. I met uh, Elizabeth in the context of a conference on witchcraft and feminism feminisms, and we had just a very electric connection. So we decided to stay in touch, and because in some way our encounter was ultra sane, but also what she was trying to uh, reflect on in that, in that conference was really very close to our, um, to our paths, uh, we invited her here. So. I don't want to say too much about the work because I'm sure it speaks by itself. as life was unfolding its mysteries. Um, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm the 
then introducing her <laughs> properly. So Elizabeth uh, Bakam Bakabamba Tambwe is a choreographer, performance artist, uh, and visual artist based in Vienna, Austria. She's born in Kinshasa. She grew up in France where she studied fine arts. Um, I skipped something. Her reflection in fine arts is based on organic architecture and her choreographic work is essentially oriented towards the sensitive and fragile dimension of the body. At the center of the work lies the critique of the concept of normality uh, that she considers tyrannical and degrading. Her latest work has been shown, among others, in uh, Tanzquartier Vienna, Donau Festival Krems, uh, Wiener Festwochen, Kunstlerhaus Wien, uh, Afro Vibes Festival Amsterdam and Bru Vienna. Tambwe is also the founder of the underground art space Chateau Rouge and the interdisciplinary format Salon Souterrain. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you, Elizabeth. Bravo. So now to navigate the format on the invocations, after such a performance, we have um, a lecture, a presentation by Patricia Gerovici. Uh, she, the, name, the title of her talk is Med to be nor male. And um, in, in the talk, Patricia is going to argue about the, uh, argue for the depatolization of non-normative expressions of sexuality and gender. Um, for psychoanalysis, sexual difference is neither sex nor gender, and sanity is neither normality nor transgression. Uh, what we can learn from trans expression is how to redefine all of these concepts. So we get to encounter the work of Patricia, researching, like also Googling, <laughs> but uh, because she collaborated with, with an artist we've been working together with, uh, Beatriz Santiago Munoz, uh, but especially because of a couple of books uh, that she published uh, as a psychoanalyst and a, an analytic supervisor. She wrote, um, among other books, uh, The Puerto Rican Syndrome in 2003, uh, Please Select Your Gender, from the invention of hysteria to the de de demo, oh my God, sorry, I'm too, to the democratizing of transgenderism in 2010, and transgender psychoanalysis, a Lacanian perspective on sexual difference in 2007. Um, she also published two edited volumes, uh, Lacan on madness, madness, you, yes, you can't. Uh, um, and most recently, she published a collection, Psychoanalysis in the Barrios, uh, Race, Class, and the Unconscious. Patricia, I don't see you. Ah, yes, you're behind me. Welcome. So I was wondering what kind of a performance I could do after what preceded. <laughs> have a lecture, could be, I hope not a dry, boring lecture, but I was reminded by a dear colleague of mine, Jameson Webster, I read a, an interview that was published yesterday, that we are always performing in one way or another, performing gender, performing roles, so let's pretend I'm an analyst, and I will tell you about what my clinical experience have taught me. Uh, when I was uh, preparing my presentation for today, I was told by Elena Gudio that this magnificent setting was in fact a crematorium. And, and, and that brought interesting echoes because I felt that somehow this was a recurrent theme in my personal history uh, because uh, the first place I practiced in the United States was in the his so-called Hispanic barrio. And uh, there in the Bloque de Oro, as it is called, Golden Block, the sidewalks are painted in yellow to commemorate the dream of getting rich quickly in America. And now whoever walks those streets encounters uh, this uh, dream a little becoming a nightmare from which many people cannot awake from, and this tarnished dream of making it big in America is confronted with the realities of urban life, of the so-called ghettos of uh, American life, and uh, there we could find maybe discarded syringe, trash, graffitis all over the place, and in that setting in the Bloque de Oro is where um, the clinic I work was placed. And the building was quite dilapidated at the time I was practicing, but I learned that before it used to be a funerary home. And my office, I came to realize, had beautiful wooden carvings that felt a little incongruous with the dismay state of the building. And I had a very old, lumpy carpet that at times had a life of its own with sinuous movements accompanying the steps. And I realized that my office used to be the room where they would bring the coffins for viewing for the last goodbye, which is, I think, similar to what this room was for. So 
this, I think, insistence of maybe perhaps the death drive may have resonances. Uh, when I was working in, in there in the clinic, uh, the death drive was very present. Uh, one day in the middle of the session, there was a drive by shooting right down under my window. And often when I would be watering the plants, I would be thinking of uh, maybe the idea of life and death because I was working with a community that was constantly challenged in a very precarious position. In my practice, I would hear every day, every single day, a report of a death a neighbor, a relative, a close friend. It was a sort of war front uh, that persists today. And uh, maybe psychoanalysis, talking, taking a person at their war, treating another person as a subject and not as a child, an object. Maybe it's a way of trying to um, be on the side of life in a situation where death seems to be threatening constantly. So to maybe play a little more on this idea of killing an other, maybe by segregating, by alienating, by pathologizing, we see different expressions of violence, and pathologization is one of them. Mm, often, one way of discriminating, of constructing an other, uh, is a way of maybe allowing myself to exist. I create a pathologized other that allows me to perhaps imagine that I can maintain my own sanity. This is something that, for instance, I could enter the, in the realm of what Franco Vasaglia called peacetime crimes. And uh, often differences between people are, we know, constructed tangentially on maybe genes that are all little bodily features. These are often projective fantasies, and uh, we live in an era of uh, fetishization of maybe skin color. Uh, we are in an era of mass migration. We see how human beings are inventing and reinforcing categories of otherness that are, to put it simply, dehumanizing. Because, as we all know, there is only one race, the human race. And then we create a sort of emporium of narcissism of small differences, and uh, maybe in this attempt to try to create otherness, I am very happy with the celebration today where maybe these lines of division seem to be blurred, the idea of altered sanity, then could may just say maybe what's the difference between the sane and in the, in the insane? Indeed, these boundaries could be quite permeable and diffuse. Uh, classically, madness, craziness, insanity, psychosis, if you will, are perhaps no more than symptom clusters considered to be impermeable to clinical intervention and are often discarded as meaningless. Silence with the straight jacket of pharmacological tools, the positive and creative potential of madness is often suppressed. For, I would say, almost 30 years, I have been trying to use my, my clinical experience working in, as a psychoanalyst in the so-called Philadelphia Barrio as a guide for my research. Everything I have written about is taught to me from the clinical experience, and I think this is a wonderful gift we have as psychoanalysts, as practitioners, is that we learn from the clinical practice and are guided by that. Working, for instance, in North Philadelphia, every time I talk about having conducted psychoanalytic treatments with poor people of color, I often encounter suspicion, I'm look with this regard, as if the idea of practicing with supposed others would be impossible, that somehow psychoanalysis will have certain class boundaries that are 
impossible. I often like to say, is, uh, people don't say it openly, but I think that in fact what they're thinking is that poor people are too poor to afford to have an unconscious. So nobody would say that openly, of course, but I think this is the underlying idea. And uh, I, I on, honestly believe, and that has been my experience, that um, treating someone who is in a very marginalized position, precarious position, as a subject, because psychoanalysis starts with the premise of assuming that we have a subjectivity divided by the existence of an unconscious, has an emancipatory potential, and this is what has been guiding my, my practice. Um, you may be as surprised as uh, I was when I will tell you what I encounter besides the challenges one would assume one would encounter working with the population, living in an inner city situation, violence, the difficulties of survival in a very precarious condition, I also discovered something that I have never heard about called the Puerto Rican syndrome. I have never encountered that in the whole terminology, and I was surprised because there is no other psychiatric diagnosis that is associated with the nationality. Nobody would talk of American anxiety, French melancholy, Argentinian narcissism, I don't know, we could say German obsessional features, and so on and so forth. But we have a Puerto Rican syndrome for a group that is not, as we know well, Puerto Rico is not an independent nation. It's a community that lives in a semi-colonial state. So I was very surprised to find that this diagnosis had been curiously um, given, invented, as it, it was in fact, by US Army doctors who were working with veterans that were coming from the Korean War. And these were soldiers that were Puerto Rican soldiers that were fighting for the American side, and they were in a very complex position as colonial uh, subjects in this com complicated situation of the Korean War, and that their symptoms, which I will describe to you, were like pseudo-epileptic crisis, uh, outbursts of rage, um, some uh, explosions of m temporary madness followed by amnesia, did not correspond to any organic cause. And all the doctors could find in common is that it happened only to Puerto Ricans. Therefore, they call it Puerto Rican syndrome. In fact, the description of the symptoms had an echo for me, which was the most classical form of hysteria. The, that I thought it was be re, going to be relegated to dusty psychiatric manuals, and it happened to be important for me, identify uh, in my performance tonight as a psychoanalyst, because it's the f classical form of hysteria that uh, when Freud was a young man, he was studying in France with Jean-Martin Charcot, the most famous neurologist of his time, he discovered a series of uh, somatic symptoms that, for which medicine could have no answer. And I'm talking about the most classical form of hysteria that I thought was completely relegated to the history of psychiatry there in the streets of the barrio. In, I'm talking about, I started working in the 90s, was alive and well and maybe forcing for the reinvention of psychoanalysis in a different context. Just quickly, I will mention, as you can hear from the name, it's a racist diagnosis that, in fact, could function as a diagnosis in reverse. Rather than telling us something of those who get the label of Puerto Rican syndrome, could tell us a lot about those who are inventing the label. So uh, the madness of uh, maybe the psychiatric uh, uh, production of, of labels. And, and it's important to know that the fact that I mentioned that the Puerto Rican syndrome was invented by the US Army doctors treating veterans of war. And it's interesting here, the gender issues, because these are not frail women brought to the theater in the Salpetriere in Paris to the face the formidable Dr. Jean-Martin Charcot. These were macho men coming from the war front, having exhibited amazing amount of courage in, the, in fighting. 
they were again apparently hystericized by this situation. Uh, it is in interesting to see how we cannot look at this symptom that when I was seeing it in the present, people were coming in the 90s diagnosed with Puerto Rican syndrome, that each individual case could find as an allegory of a social situation that, for instance, this diagnosis I was mentioning to you was invented by the U.S. Veteran Administration. Almost diagnosis in what we call the Bible of Psychiatric Diagnosis, the DSM, the Diagnostic, Manual, Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. Most of the diagnosis come from the U.S. Armed Forces. So there's sort of war, we hear poems about war. One of the results of war is the invention of new diagnosis. So we see how, how we cannot not think politically, how the individual and the social seem to be closely intertwined. And, and we see, for instance, reverberations of these racist practices when the Puerto Rican syndrome reappears in the DSM in what is called an appendix of culturally bound syndrome. Only otherness is pathologized because uh, depression, for instance, not all cultures have a symptom of depression. All the diagnoses in this diagnostic manual happen to be diagnoses that are acceptable within the American context. So we see how at times cultural difference could be labeled as madness, perhaps. So to sum up what I learned from my encounter with the Puerto Rican syndrome is that we see how this flawed uh, diagnosis that really is not a clinical tool, doesn't help people alleviate their pain. It's a way of label them and uh, stigmatizing them and really not opening the possibility of discourse, but cl closing speech. Uh, we see that somehow there is a sort of dimension of a colonial history, uh, an island that has been historically subjected to warfare and invasions, and, and it continues being ravaged by now natural disasters that cannot be uh, read without the intervention of uh, political and economic uh, factors. So in a way, what we could do by putting the Puerto Rican syndrome to, to work by seeing what, what are these people expressing, these bodies in pain, what are they saying? And it could be read um, as a sort of response to this colonializing uh, attitude, that it, it was, it's a possibility of uh, maybe uh, avoid the model, the medical model that tries to maybe alienate even more uh, subjects that are in precarious positions within a very difficult power structure and maybe allow for a little bit of freedom. So maybe with the idea of freedom and, and being a, a free to maybe express oneself, one's own madness, maybe I would like to reflect with you for a second on, on this idea of maybe putting aside the insanity of diagnosis, think about what, what are we talking about when we talk about madness. Uh, already the term, which is a term I, I like to hold on to, uh, the term madness uh, has sort of protean qualities as we have seen today, all the manifestations that different presentations during the day allow. The term madness and the vicissitudes of its clinic has protean qualities. Um, is madness is a sort of shape-shifting um, oracular monsters, we may say, and is capable of uh, expressing things about itself or about the others who s s locate madness, as we have seen with the Puerto Rican syndrome. Whose madness are we talking about? Uh, medical historian Ray, Roy Potter called madness the mystery of mysteries. So madness itself produces these uh, expressions, allows us to discover things, but we cannot really grasp madness itself. What does it mean? Apparently, if we look at the history of madness, is as old as humanity itself. As far as back as 10,000 years, we find archeological evidence of skulls that have holes in them. And uh, many anthropologists and medical historians seem to, uh, to coincide in the hypothesis that these 
recurrent holes in the cranium, in the skull, uh, were the result of trepanations. In fact, there were attempts at extracting from the brain the stone of madness. So we may see that even since the beginning of the history of madness, there has been a hole, and that hole persists. Nowadays, despite the innovation in pharmacology, the array of diagnoses that seem to multiply, as soon as we have a new drug, we need to invent a new diagnosis that that drug will be able to treat. Uh, brain research, brain mapping, imaging, madness continues to be, to haunt us, to haunt not only the practitioner, also the, the, mm, the specialist, the historian, the researcher. We, it seems to be this amorphous uh, entity that I think I would like to uh, hold on to because it also has a, a, a potential quality that is, it, it, it dilutes the boundaries between uh, sane and insane. That's why I like the idea of ultra sanity as a form of ultra madness. It will be hard to tell one apart from the other. So, for instance, the ways we hear people explaining madness, some say wiring of the brain is genetic. Often we forget that all these uh, explanations we come up with are simply metaphors. And, uh, and even though the, for instance, pharmacological industry is trying to impose this a cure, this magic remedy, the magic pill, we still do not have a, a solid explanation about why is it produced, what does it mean, and often we tend to, to believe in the fetishization of uh, treating the mind, the spirit, the soul, the psyche, as a sort of malfunctioning machine that only an engineer of the soul would be able to, to cure. We are, of course, aware of all the political and social, um, religious even, uh, violence and bi balances of the war madness. And, uh, and as we know, uh, madness uh, may after all, be simply just a social creation, and, uh, and could be a, a also, I think, a, a denunciation uh, if we look at the stigma attached often to the word of madness. And here, I, I, as the title talks about anti-psychiatry, we know the work of Thomas Sass, uh, who has persuaded us that madness should be simply addressed as a, a myth, a myth like also mental health could be another myth or sanity itself. So it's important also maybe to, to follow in this tradition of anti-psychiatry to, to realize that at times those who are labeled as mad are those who do not comply to, with normative behavior. So um, often they are subject to what we may call a witch hunt. Well, I was curious about the idea of witchcraft and often the mad are, are subjects to witch hunts. Uh, our delay, for instance, has shown us that uh, insanity is often used as a derogative label to a scapegoat and segregate those who deviate from social norms. Whether or not madness is purely a social construct a myth, or maybe just a label, uh, clinicians have an ethical responsibility because those who seem to be non-sane often come to us presenting some sort of suffering. Madness could be at times very reassuring, but at times could haunt, could torment. And I think as clinicians, we have a responsibility not to withdraw in the face of madness. And uh, it's interesting, again, to, to keep in mind that we need to uh, um, be aware of the permeability of the boundaries between those who are mad and those who are not mad. And Freud already taught us that this, uh, this uh, distinction between sanity and insanity uh, it's hard to, to maintain because, for instance, he observed that we are all insane in our dream life. So if we 
in think that we spend one, one third of our life sleeping, those who don't have insomnia or get to sleep enough, let's say 25, 30% of our life, 35% sleeping, it means that we spend one third of our lives mad. And, and it's interesting, maybe if we look at dreams, uh, because Freud developed a system of dream interpretation based on the analogy between dreams and insanity. And uh, he was echoing the assertion of Schopenhauer, who already in 1764 said, the madman is a waking dreamer. Or Schopenhauer, yeah. who quipped that, and I quote, dreams are a brief madness and madness a long dream, end quote. So maybe there is something to keep in mind that the more we learn about uh, dreams, the more we may understand madness or the reverse, that perhaps the mystery of dreams could be revealed uh, through madness. And if madness, like dreams, could be as well a sort of royal path to the unconscious. But um, perhaps we, we need to, to think that the, uh, the difference we could establish for those who may be mad and those who may not, that if uh, the unconscious should be the thing that is not conscious or hidden, for the mad person, they are already there. They already arrive at a sort of a truth of the unconscious uh, in open sky. That's what Freud tells us. So, um, Maybe talking about the truth of the unconscious, I was telling you that everything I, I learned was, or I write about is taught through the clinic as if the couch would be a sort of window to reality, but it's like a queen, window of a train in motion, where at times when you turn around to look back, it has already passed, or it's too fast and you just see lines of color. Thanks to this wonderful window of, of the practice of the couch, of what patients bring to the office, I also discovered other forms of madness that have to do with uh, maybe the fact that we have to live in a body that is not a given reality, that as the English expression betrays, we are not bodies, we have a body. And often embodiment, and I think the performance we saw before, we could see all the problems in assuming and, and the challenges and the joys of uh, having a, a bodily and embodied experience. I heard something interesting that also challenges the, the sort of uh, what is normal and what is not normal, if we maybe translate what madness may relate to. When I started hearing in the presentations of my patients questions about sexual identity, that made me abandon the quiet solitude of my office and uh, have to delve deeply into the uh, troubled waters of identity politics. When I had heard from patients a question about gender identity that was presented Mm, as a question uh, such as, am I straight or bisexual? And I was thinking, in, oh, well, this may be just a classical question about gender identity, about mm, maybe what is to be a man, what is to be a woman, or what is to be anything else in between. But maybe one assumption also I had, well, maybe my patients read Judith Butler, they're thinking that gender is performative and this is why they're posing these questions. I started comparing this question with the predicament of patients who identify as transgender, for whom it wasn't so much the problem, the question, am I straight, am I bisexual, what am I, but rather I, I am, and my body, what my being is contradicted by how my body has been assigned. For instance, I always fell as a girl and, uh, and, and I was born into a, a male body. Or, or to quote directly from a patient who said to me, I was born with the worst birth defect a woman can have. I was born with a penis and testicles. So how to make sense maybe of a new madness a madness of perhaps those norms we impose 
on uh, different forms of uh, living in a body. And here, perhaps, I, I try to take distance from the more recent developments of psychoanalysis and go back to the early days of psychoanalysis. Uh, during research, I realized that in the early days of uh, Freud, the early days of psychoanalysis, when it was an emerging discipline um, in psychoanalysis, here in Berlin, the first, uh, the Berlin Society was founded by Abraham in collaboration with Hirschfeld, with Magnum Hirschfeld, who was, uh, for those who, who may know uh, the name, he was a very important activist in the history of uh, LGBT rights. And, and it was a political figure. So there was a very close collaboration between political uh, activism, somebody who uh, was helpful in, in, in accomplishing the first gender transitions. I'm talking about uh, early 20th century. And, uh, and, and there was a collaboration between psychoanalysis and this emerging field of sexology that was lost and then maybe to go back to a history of psychoanalysis of pathologizing uh, forms of uh, uh, non-normativity. So to maybe conclude my, my presentation, I would like to maybe go back to a Freud, an early a a reading of Freud that would be um, something I like to call it a pink Freud, which is a reading Freud following, for instance, some of his ideas about uh, proposing uh, a libido, a sexual libido, a drive that is by definition skewed, that is queer. We may say that psychoanalysis could be considered queer in that sense, in the sense that there is no norm for uh, sexuality that could be sustained, that for instance, it would be as difficult at ex to explain from a psychoanalytic perspective how a person makes an homosexual sexual choice as to explain how that person may make heterosexual sexual choice or in a way that Perhaps what I had learned from my patients who identify as, uh, as trans is uh, that the difficulties in assuming a sexual being is equally difficult for someone who is cis and it may be for somebody who is trans. So to conclude, maybe not to go too much into detail, uh, uh, into the madness of psychoanalysis, which may be my own personal madness, I will uh, just mention rapidly that uh, often what I, I found that is a point of connection with uh, we could imagine that the uh, madness is a form of solution that perhaps as that's the way Freud read the case of President Schreber, that the delusion had a sort of a peacing effect. At times, uh, constructing a, what may be labeled as a delusion could be a way, a, an a spontaneous attempt at a cure. That's why we were uh, saying this morning in the workshop with Dora Garcia that at times, medicating this delusion, if, as it were, would be a way of getting rid of something that could be a solution, a cure, a spontaneous form of cure. So I would uh, try to mm, put the accent on, on the idea that not only maybe at times somebody suffering, maybe mad, may need psychoanalysis, that perhaps psychoanalysis needs to learn from madness. And, and keeping in mind a sort of ethics of uh, the practice where maybe the notions of uh, normality are, 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 are to be maintained in a sort of precarious, contingent uh, manner, and maybe think that perhaps, uh, for instance, uh, the assumption of a sexual position, a gender, or a within the binary, or elsewhere altogether, or without, outside the binary, requires a sort of moment of creation, and the, this is where the two uh, concepts come together, that madness could be a form of a, a creation and, and a, a way to come up with a solution. In, in a way, we are all confronted with having to deal with our embodied existence and developing a sort of knowing how to, a sort of 
art as it were, but art not in the sense of boss art, but maybe in the sense of uh, uh, the word art in Greek, techne, and know-how. That in a way we are all uh, required to come up with a sort of art or artifice to assume our beings in the world as sex mortal beings. And uh, to conclude, would be the artists that we saw in, in, in the show, the, the, the different invocations that we heard all day, we see that here maybe this fine line between what the mad uh, is, what, what is mad, what is pathological, uh, could maybe be resolved by seeing the creativity that this uh, activity could have, that madness. Uh, does not only manifest in suffering or a maladjusted uh, or aberrant response, that there is another way for madness to be transformed into an individual and creative solution, an invention, uh, which may become a, another way of thinking about cure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. So we're running, unfortunately, late this evening, so I'm going to try to be short with the intro to our next performer. Before we get to the performance, we're going to have a 15-minute break, for which I will, 15, just to, just to have it solidly as planned. Um, no drinks will be allowed inside, and for your knowledge, when you return, it's going to be an interactional performance consensual completely, so if at any point you wouldn't like to participate, give the performers a sign and they will acknowledge. So, to give a briefing of the piece, Lucas Hoffman with Mirabella, Paid Amoyo, Scott Hopper, Luzek Marni, Adrian Quentin Vardy, Elena Velekait, and Nico Walker. Allergy, eczema, itches, and scratches, as our hyperactive immune systems throw a fit. Porous skin bordering between ourselves and the world, its cells spreading and turning to dust. And an allergic reaction, a self-deterrent, overprotective body chooses to consume itself. It sends out histamines in an, effect, in an effort to cope with itself and responds xenophobically to the environment around. Skin is a permeable border and such failures of a hypersensitive immune system can be freely transposed onto wire societal issues. The performance examines allergy as a process of self-sabotage. Dry, peeled skin as a motor of restorative power. It constitutes a loose allegory of biological xenophobia, but also individual and widespread forms of anxiety. The theme of body cell replacement offers scope for exploring alternatives to such sentiments. Dust, which the artist's own skin produces an extraordinary amount of, is read by Hoffman largely as a signifier of self-destruction and self-renewal, the body being able to exchange almost all of its cells in seven to 15 years, all its upper skin layer in about three weeks. The name of the final chapter of Hoffman's series, Skin Come Leather, Volume 3, which you could also see downstairs in the form of an installation at the exhibition, finds source in the liminal occurrence when an animal creature undergoes a rather rudimentary process of having fat and hairs removed, stored in salt, undergoing chrome treatment, rendering its skin blue, then being recolored and given its natural look. The skin at the time becomes an elastic commodity, skin to leather. During this performance, vials of water, of life and death, will be in use. According to Slavic mythology, trickling all the way down into modern TV fairy tales, which Hoffman grew up with in post-communist Czech Republic, these liquids were used to bring back the dead to life and heal wounds respectively. Using tinctures developed in cooperation with a perfumer, the group of actants open and close wounds inflicted by the contemporary condition. So we will have now a 15 minute break and then you'll be welcomed to re-enter in fluid motion, but only from this side of the space. Thank you.
When he knocked on my door and entered the room, my trembling subsided in his sure embrace. He would be my first man, and with a careful hand, he wiped out the tears that ran down my face. They call me the wild rose. But my name was lies a day. Why they call me, I do not know. For my name was lies a day. So sweet and scarlet and free. On the second day, he came with a singular look. He said, Me a lot in your sorrow. I did not in my head as I lay on the bed. If I show you the roses, will you fall? Her the wild rose. My name is a lie today. Why they want me that I do not know. My name is a lie today. On the third day, he took me to the river. Show me the roses, and we kissed. And the last thing I heard was a muttered word as he knelt above me with the rock in his fist. On the last day I took her where the wild roses grow. As she lay on the bank, the wind lied as a thief, and I kissed her goodbye. Said, old beauty must die. And I lend down a planted a rose between her teeth. They call her the white rose. It was a lie today. Why they call me the
was the sun shining upon Separating me from you. She was the wind carrying you
anything?
lullabies for the dispossessed. Part three. In the burning of the Republic, it is always the flattened mountain that performs the first act of self immolation. Then the shacks. Too close, a mouth with too many teeth jostling for attention in protest of their own impoverishment. And the people within them follow. And art schools we can't afford, and burning schools burning because we have no way to learn. Fire in the peripheries we've been relegated to. Queer black body spinning on the tip of a candle flame. Borders incinerated. And no one who says cattle and Bibles and prayer beads and hymn books aflame. For those in the coordination of the modalities of war and worship, who follow the fire and study incineration, it is not alarming at all that the gods have begun to appear at their own places of worship. They step off their gilded thrones, descending on billowy sheepskin clouds. They lower themselves, scorned in light, amongst blare and horn, forlorn shrills and toots and booms. They hide themselves in the blaring, repudiating their light for hours. It is not alarming that the gods are knelt down in supplication at their own altars. They have begun to pray to themselves, prostrate to the feet of their own effigies. They have begun to pray for themselves, sacrificing their truth for new ones, chanting under their breaths. We need new hymns. We need new psalms. We need new hymns. We need new psalms. The country is simmering. Whispers in the deep have become a raging in the light. Machetes and hammers are aimed at inanimate statues. Buses ablaze. Libraries crumble into ash. There is no value in the promise of the future when promises no longer suffice. Gods become irrelevant, impotent, when we possess the power to pray our own devils back to hell. First a murmur, a rumble in the distance, a bag full of desperation and desire dragged along the gravelly path. The past and now, a warning, an affirmation, a premonition, then a demand to be heard, to be loved, to drag the deities from the sanctified places, to place the salt of our tears on the pink of their tongues. We are no longer invoking, we are interceding and insisting. Then will be now, then, then will be now, then, then, then will be now. We need new hymns, we need new psalms, we need new peoples. Then will be now, we need new psalms, we need new people. Renew thyself, renew thyself, renew thyself, renew thyself. You know the path.
of peace are no longer the people who profess to peace are no longer all I hear of from my friends and foes is violence, death and pain the days of no peace are no longer the people of no peace live all I hear of is fear pain and suffering
This violence doesn't touch us We're tired of hiding at night Said we're tired of hiding in the day yes. Won't you release us from this pain? Won't you see ourselves for what we are? Where we place ourselves over the stars Oh God, release us, oh God, release us, oh God, release us To our higher cause, to why we're here around this play No, oh, won't you just let us find a sense of being Where we don't have to all work, we don't have to all work so work, oh yeah. So work, oh yeah. So work, oh yeah. Cause we are all black women, all of us black women, and we are all. Struggles in our strife in our Monday to Sunday Struggles in our strife We're all black women in our pain Oh, black woman And we are all black woman The woe, the mother, the child, the mother The child, the mother, the child, the mother The child, we are all black women In our strife, in our struggles We are all black women in our struggles, in our strife, we are all black women, 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 we are all black songs and we definitely need your people
the spirits are back. <laughs> Thank you, Sia Bonga and, and Yahima. I'm now very humbled, and I don't want to, to move the mic because it's already uh, measured on, on Professor Hicklin. I'm very humbled to welcome uh, uh, Professor Frederick Heiklin, uh, who was extremely patient because since, uh, since he arrived uh, yesterday, he has been following interruptedly our program and has been spending all his time with us. Uh, so instead of stealing time to him and introducing him, uh, I think uh, I, let, uh, I let him do it <laughs> because he's uh, um, yeah, a much better, in a, a better position to introduce himself. So the title of his lecture is Owning Our Madness. Brothers and sisters, in Jamaica we say one love, one heart, one destiny. And I really want us to give a warm, warm blessing to the musicians who have helped to bring the vibe back into the into the room, to warm the room up. Let's give them a warm. Because I tell you, if it hadn't been for the musicians, I would have had us singing in here tonight. <laughs> I promise you. But hey, we have, a, we have a lot of things to talk about, so let's start. I really want to thank Savvy Contemporary for, for making this possible this, this evening, because this is really a wonderful and spectacular, groundbreaking international um, event, and it, it is worthy of what has been happening. So I, I really want to go right ahead to say, Savi asked me to speak about owning our madness, contributions of Jamaican psychiatry to decolonizing mental health. And you see, the, it, it, this has come from a recent article that I published in Transcultural Psychiatry. Uh, and I have to say to you what I say to my colleagues and to my students and to my friends and to my children. If you haven't published it, you haven't done it. If you haven't written it, you haven't done it. So you have to write it. So let's write this. You see, I had really had this idea about owning our madness, because I wrote this book in Jamaica a few years ago. It's not reached international publication yet, because it's really more for the Jamaican people, but it, it would be worthy for an international people too, but it will come. And so that's where the idea of the owning our madness came. There's a long story to that. Let me say something else. I have lots and lots and lots of slides and lots and lots and lots of stories. For almost for each slide, there is a story. But, so I'm not gonna get diverted and, uh, along these issues. We're gonna try to, to, to keep to the script. But let me tell you, that's not the title that I had originally sent them. I sent Savvy a different title. It's them change it up on me. <laughs> them, but it's all right, I can manage that. Because my title was Decolonizing Madness, T-R-M-S. What T-R-M-S mean? It means this ras must stop. All right. It don't mean nothing to you people, you know, but in Jamaica, ras is one of the biggest bad words that you can, that you can find. So when you tell somebody T-R-M-S, it means this ras must stop. So I'm saying colonialism, that madness must stop. TRMS. When you look into the Dictionary of Jamaican English by Cassidy and Lepid, Ra simply means buttocks. Your ass. It's a common Jamaican swear word. But it's a Jamaican neologistic weaponization of words. We are good at it. You have to understand that if you're a slave, 
and you did anything unusual, they'd kill you or flog you or torture you. So you had to find a way to tell your slave master in a way to express your anger and your rage at him so you'd tell him about your wrath. So in other words, it has meaning for us. It has meaning for Jamaican people. It's considered very vulgar. The, the British didn't understand it at the beginning. But when they did realize that it was an insult to them, they put it into law that if you use the word, you could be fined 40 shillings. Now I'm going to have these objectives for this presentation. First of all, we have to understand colonialism. And we have to understand the relationship between complex trauma and the human brain. And the legacy of colonialism and slavery in Jamaica and the Caribbean. And the, col the Caribbean the colonial origin of madness and treatment. And the pioneering psychohistoriographic cultural therapy that we have developed in Jamaica. And how we have tamed psychosis at home and abroad. The complex trauma in descendants of Africans en uh, enslaved in the descendants, us descendants of Africans enslaved in the new in the new world and in Jamaica, and how to deal with the decolonizing of this mental enslavement by using a public health model and taking psychiatry to schools. So that's the extent of what we're going to be dealing with in this evening. So. I'm going to punctuate it at every stop. T R M S. This ras must stop. First of all, we have to understand colonialism and what I call the European American psychosis. And if you look at all the, the green on that map, these are all the countries in the world that have been under the, con the control of Europe over the past several years. Um, centuries. When Columbus came to the New World, he must have identified, it must be identified as being driven by what I call what is, in fact, a primary delusion that has shaped contemporary psychological experience. Imagine this small group of white people arriving in a boat after 10 or 12 weeks across the Atlantic, not having enough food and enough water and starving and hungry, and they arrive in this place of paradise, wonderful paradise. And they look at it and they say, this all belongs to me. And you all in here belong to me. And your wife and your husband and your children, you all belong to me. That must be the primary grandiose delusion of Europe. The primary European delusion is a fixed false belief of ownership, impervious to rational argument and out of keeping with cultural belief. Carl Jaspers, who is one of the, the psychiatrists in Germany who I've, I, I have read a lot of his work, to, that defines primary delusions as being distinguished by a transformation of meaning so that the word or aspects of it are interpreted in a radically different way, the world. So when Columbus arrived and, and claimed ownership, it was claimed by divine right. God gave white people the right to overtake the world and to take it over as their own. As their own. But the students of today know that that's rubbish because Columbus did not discover America. He invaded it. This book by Charles Duff showed that Columbus was the father of the colonial delusion. He was obsessed by his great idea of discovering this land to the West. There was no feat of lying and exaggeration or misrepresentation or hypocrisy to which he would not rise. He was capable of sharp practices and utmost dishonesty and even cruelty. He had a megalomaniac's craving for power. And he had the strangest hallucinations. Speaking of the voices which spoke to him about this discovery that he was making. And the European delusion, which was out of keeping with rational argument, 
because all resistance by rational argument was met with genocidal extermination. So there was no way that you could argue with him, like you can't argue with people who hold a serious delusion because the argument was just not melted. He just killed you. Las Casas, in 1542, uh, wrote a number of books. He was, a, he, was, he was a monk, Bartholomew de Las Casas, and he wrote about the destruction of the, of the, of the Taino tribes by the Spaniards in that period. The Columbus legacy of genocide, with 70 to 100 million indigenous people were killed by the Europeans. People don't know this. People do, or people don't remember this, or certainly they try to make the history out differently. This is supposed to have a music track on it, but I don't hear it. <laughs> right. Do you remember the days of slavery? Do you remember the days of slavery? Gone again. Let's go back, let's see if we can get it. concept of slavery is a secondary delusion. The, the concept of, of primary ownership is a prime delusion, but a slavery is a secondary delusion that arose out of the primary delusion. Jaspers again said that the secondary delusion are delusion-like ideas understandable in the context of a person's life history, personality, mood states, and in keeping with the presence of other psychopathology. <clears throat> the secondary delusions of slavery emerged from European colonialism, the beliefs of white supremacy, the formulation of three-fifths humanity of black people, the belief of ownership by divine right, and absolute sexual and vocational ownership and exploitation of both men and women. In the New World, African slavery emerged from European colonialism and the social engineering of colonial slavery. Orlando Patterson, one of the Jamaica, great Jamaican sociologists, has written about the sociology of slavery. Cruel punishments were greatly responsible for high mortality rates. Some of the Negro slaves are whipped and even hanged for going into the woods. And the methods of European social engineering by mental enslavement included flagellation of men and women, but particularly women, because if you beat the women in front of the men, the men would have to comply. The Atlantic slave trade and the Middle Passage was what made Europe great. The triangular trade where where all manufactured goods came from Europe to the New World, Africa and the New World. Africa took slaves across to the New World and raw materials came from the New World to Europe. That's how Europe was made. That's how all of the wealth in Europe in, in, the, in, the, in those four, first three, 400 years, that's where it came from. It wasn't. It didn't come drop out of the sky. It came from exploitation of other people's resources. For the past five centuries, Europe has been fighting over possession and social engineering of the Caribbean and the Americas. Five centuries. And there are eight European countries that have been involved in that fight. And it's now become a vacation paradise for Europe and the Americas because they still own it. Europe still owns us. So the legacy of 400 years of African slave labor for European plantations in the West Indies has had a significant epigenetic consequence on the mental health people of Caribbean. 
Bismarck introduced the Treaty of Berlin in 1885, which actually engineered the European colonialism of Africa. What the slide on that side shows in 1880 what Africa looked like in terms of ownership. And by 1913, that, that Africa looked completely different because the six or seven European countries had divided Africa um, amongst itself. You see, Germany had three big spots, the brown ones. Those were the German spots. So the partition of Africa led to all of these countries which were owned by Europe. There was this wonderful book written by a, a Scandinavian, Sven Lindqvist, Exterminate All the Brutes is the title. In practice, the whole of Europe acted in according with the maxim, exterminate all the brutes. Officially, it was denied, but man to man, everyone knew. It is out of this that has brought me to write about the European-American psychosis. Uh, you, from a psychohistoriographic uh, perspective of contemporary Western civilization. In other words, if you haven't written it, you haven't done it. And I've created a taxonomy of the European-American psychosis. It's a complex primary delusion, a paranoid delusion of white supremacy, the grandiose delusion of ownership by divine right, the delusion of jealousy, wanting to possess others, and the delusion of reference of all other races as subhuman. The secondary delusion arising from the primary delusion are the three elements of slavery, genocide, and the narcissistic, narcissistic principle of property ownership. These are racism, prejudice, xenophobia, intolerance, microaggression, racial progression, name calling, bullying, and hate crimes, felony based on prejudice against a group, violent crime based on prejudice against a group, racial murder, lynching, mass shootings, terrorism, torture, torture, abuse, infliction of pain. My friend in Martinique, Professor Amy Charles Nicholas, put on a conference two years ago in Martinique on, about slavery. What is the impact on psychology of populations? How did psychology affect the brains and the mental health of not only the slaves, but the slave owners? Because you can't have one without the other, and there's a mental health, dialectical mental health relationship between the two. The Europeans, in their perspective, and their philosophical perspective, the contemporary memory has forgotten the so-called civilizing mission of the Europeans. The European, the European philosophers, psychologists, psychologists and, and, and um, writers all wrote about the civilizing mission. It was as if they were doing us a favor. They were doing themselves a favor. The civilizing mission of the European-American psychosis has le left indelible complex trauma on the populations of the colonized world. TRMS, this race must stop. Complex trauma and the epigenetic effect on the human brain. I think I told some people last night that I'm, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not only a psychiatrist, I'm a medical doctor, but I'm also a trained neuroanatomist. And I'm very in, intrigued in the aspects of complex trauma. Trauma that occurs repeatedly over a long period of time some forms of physical abuse, long-standing sexual abuse, domestic violence, and war. It's been well written about in the last 15 years that complex trauma is the underlying cause of mental psychopathology. 
So you have complex for sexual, physical abuse, witnessing rape and assault of mother, emotional abuse, neglect, physical neglect, emotional neglect, war, terrorism, forced migration, all by a paper by Gilgo in 2016. A lot of research is being done in this area, in the area of complex trauma. Complex trauma arises from stressful interpersonal relationship and often results in long-standing intrapsychic emotional pain in children and adults. And the mental slavery of Africans, the experience of pain is complex and subjective and is affected by factors such as cognition, distraction, catastrophizing, mood, belief, and genetics. And that leads to post-traumatic stress disorder, severe anxiety disorders. And this slide just shows the wide range of, of assaults of physical trauma that can cause PTSD. And this, the psychiatric understanding of PTSD of the brain requires an overstanding of psychological dissociation. Overstanding is a Rastafarian neologistic word. It's a phon phon phonological dialectic inversion where understanding means knowledge and overstanding means insight. As Ajani said to us, understanding is good but overstanding is better. Psychological dissociation is a strange condition. It's an adaptive defense mechanism of the psyche. It's the brain attempting to process something painful, a feeling of unreality, watching oneself from outside, an as if phenomenon, as if my body does not belong to me, the disconnection of a sense of self from personal history, involuntary splitting of mental function from the personality and the expression of for forbidden non-conscious impulses. And dissociation has three stages. The healthy stage, the primary dissociation of mild phobias and mild PTSD, the secondary dissociations of complex PTSD, and finally, the tertiary associations of, of, of identity disorders. And when the psychoanalyst was talking this, earlier on this evening, I had to smile because I recognized all of the, the patients that she was describing. And they all are dissociative phenomena. And I've seen lots of them in Jamaica and all over the world. In other words, there is an increasing severity of dissociation as you go from normal up along the complexity line. So you have PTSD trauma, which is primary, PTSD complex, which is secondary, and dissociative PTSD, which is tertiary. And of course, here are the symptoms of PTSD, and here are the symptoms of complex PTSD, because they are just more and more symptoms, one on top of the other. It's as if I found this beautiful slide which really reflects the dissociative phenomenon. It's as, as if the whole mental status just actually disappears, as in fugue states, conversion amnesia, and identity disturbance. And when you look at it in, the, in PET scans, um, you will find that PT complex trauma recurring repeatedly over long periods of time shows up very clearly in the abused brain. These are the non-colored areas circling in the, in the slide. This is what you see when your TV breaks down. And it's an analogous, analogous event occurs in the brain with the onset of PTSD and dissociation disorders. That's what happens with you, and it happens to all of us from time to time, mild, moderate, severe. Mild happens to everyone at some time in their life. Depersonalization is the third most common psychological symptom after feelings of anxiety and depression. And I told you I was anatomist. Dissociation and depersonalization disorders occur in the limbic system of the human brain. And of course, we could talk a lot about this, but this is not a neuroanatomical neuro lecture. Complex trauma and violence in Jamaica 
the colonial origins of madness and its treatments in Jamaica, TRMS. Columbus meeting the Tainos, 1492. Bartholomew de las Casas reminding us of the genocide. But de las Casas also told us something else, <clears throat> that he observed that the indigenous inhabitants, the Taino Indians, treating their mentally ill in a caring communal manner. They allowed them to wander at large. Everybody looked after them. It was community engagement was how it was handled. Las Casas wrote about that from six centuries ago. But then in, this, in 1655, the, the British fought the, the, the Spanish and captured Jamaica. And the first governor, Sir Henry Morgan, was a celebrated pirate, a thief, a murderer, the heritage of Jamaican political leadership. Jamaica was born and suckled on violence. We were fighting for our lives all the time. And all of us, all Jamaicans, descendants of Africans enslaved in the New World, are coming out of the cane, of the cane peace, coming out of the plantation. And we all had to fight for life, and we are still fighting for life. The response to oppression of slavery was rebellion and violence. There was a slave revolt in Jamaica every 31 years between 1655 and 1999. I wrote a paper on this a few years ago because nobody had sat down and done the math and showed that the rebellion occurred. Every 31 years, it's like a cistern overflowing. And we'll, but that's another lecture, we can talk about that one. The legacy of colonialism and slavery in Jamaica and the Caribbean. If you look at the business now of, of Hegel's dialectic of the master and the slave, an equal power and authority. Bakra Massa, the master, the house and field slave. Physical and economic and e emotional dependency. Love and hate and anger and rage and helplessness were, were behind the power struggles of violent rebellion. The British set up two types of colonies. They set up a plunder colony and a settler colony. Jamaica's a plunder colony. And Barbados is an example of a settler colony. A plunder colony was engineered for plantation productivity. It had strong institutions for the maintenance of law and order, the constabulary, the judiciary, prisons, the lunatic asylums. And the educational and social institutions were exclusively for the elite. And the white colonialists left their wives and families behind and so had to cohabit with the black women. That's what happened in Jamaica. That's why there are so many miscegenated Jamaicans like myself. In Barbados, it was different. The white colonizers brought their wives and entire families and cohabitation with the African or indigenous women was prohibited. The white women had tremendous power over the white men. They couldn't play around. This is a slide out of Barbados, which I got from my brother-in-law, who is a white Barbadian, <clears throat> of showing the whites relaxing in the Barbadian environment, but the white men and their wives relaxing. There was no time for pussyfooting. Professor Vereen Shepard from UWI has written a lot on the history of women in slavery <clears throat> and has described the legacy of slavery on the African family. First of all, slaves, the price of slaves were, was rising. So by the time it got to the, the, the early 19th century, it was just too expensive for slave owners to, to, <clears throat> to, to import new slaves. It therefore made better sense for them to get the women to produce slaves. So they started the, the business of, 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 of getting the slave women to, to produce the children. Of course, the, the legacy of slavery on the African family in the first part of slavery 
was exactly what Donald Trump is doing right now. It split the children away from the mothers, <clears throat> and split the fathers away from the mothers, and, and put them in different sides of the island. That's what Trump is doing right now. It's the same. It's a return of the repressed that's coming back in real life <clears throat> at this time. And Douglas Hall, who was a professor of history at the University of the West Indies, wrote this wonderful book called In Miserable Slavery um, about Thomas Thistlewood, who was a British estate <clears throat> overseer and small landowner. But the thing about, about Thistlewood uh, was that he wrote a diary, and he was absolutely explicit about his sexual proclivities with black men and women <clears throat> on the plantation. It was horrendous, and it is one of the few documents that we have in the world that actually describes the way in which white people dealt with black people at that time. The sexual depravity and cruelty of Jamaican slave owners of the period was described in graphic detail. And the social engineering of the African family that maintained dependency and protected profits for the slavers was well chronicled. <clears throat> Male rape and the era of homosexuality was in that first phase of slavery, the legacy of slavery on black people. Married slave facing wenching, wrenching, meaning that they were wrenched apart, <clears throat> is another aspect of the legacy. And the legacy of serial monogamy, in which you have one woman living by themselves, they weren't allowed to have a man living with them, but the, the man could only cohabit the man would have to have a visiting relationship. This was engineered by white people who broke up the families. So the black men had to visit the white women and they, therefore they would have <clears throat> two children with the, with the same woman and then that would break up and then she would cohabit with another. She would end up having five baby fathers and eight or 10 children, all of which bred <clears throat> all of these psychological problems of hate and incest and sexual abuse and physical abuse and low self-esteem and jealousy and theft and violence and identity issues. All because of the serial monogamy which exists until today that explains the behavior of, the, of black families in this time. This is not a, a cultural aspect of black people. This is something engineered by white European slavery. Herbert Gale, which is one who's one of our anthropologists, <clears throat> has done this research that showed that soon after emancipation in 1838, there were zero black fathers living in, in families. Over the, over the next 150 years, it's grown to about 47%. But in, in, after independence, there were 100% black women and that's been coming down slightly. So the figures are meeting, but we still have another 150 years to go to get the two lines to meet if you, if you project them along. Now, a wonderful book was written <clears throat> by an English woman in 1948 called Madeleine Carr and on the, the personality and conflict in Jamaica. And she was a sociologist and she went to live in the, in the villages in Jamaica and they reported five things. The pervasive and persisting impact, persisting impact of the slave tradition. The difficulties regarding skin colors that exist throughout the Caribbean till today. A split in the construction of parental roles and lack of patterned and culturally relevant learning in childhood. And the fifth one is a dichotomy in religious versus magical beliefs. So Jamaica now, in the present time, a low middle income country, 2.9 million, 2017, cap per capita of, eight, of eight, 8,690 um, per year, Life expectancy 75.9%, which is the same as Europe. Means that our health of our people now is as good as yours or better, certainly better than America. Fertility rate of 2.01. <clears throat> but 
But the murder rate, no. The murder rate is, in, is just phenomenal. 2017, it was 56 per 100,000. <clears> Jamaica ranks fourth in the world, the highest murder rate. But the mean suicide rate in Jamaica is 2.1 per 100,000. And that is, in fact, the third lowest in the entire world. What the paradox is this? The paradox is that Jamaicans um, don't kill themselves, they kill each other. That's the paradox. But you see, the reality is now that we have been studying it carefully, we realize that the hidden, that suicide is hidden in what we'll talk about later, with, later which is suicide by gangs, suicide by cops. In other words, the young men get killed at an early age by their involvement in the, in the criminal world with the police and the gangs. So the suicide rate is hidden in the high murder rate of the country. But we're doing the work. We are scientists, we are sociologists, we are psychologists, we are psychiatrists, and we are studying our own country. And the history is that when the British uh, in 1660 started, the health of the slaves was the responsibility of the slave owners. And if anybody got mentally ill to be treat, could treatable, they would be housed in the plantation, hot houses or dungeons like this one that's there. <clears throat> Who ever heard of a mad slave? You ever heard of a slave getting mad? He would be killed immediately if he was, if he was going around the place. Or if he was just wandering around, maybe they'd flog him or put him in a hot house. This man, Sir Andrew Halliday, a British physician in 1828, <clears throat> he said that slavery is rare in the West Indies and Africans. Samuel Cartwright, on the other hand, now said that, that described diesthesia Ethiopius, a diagnosis of, of diagnosable signs included disobedience, answering disrespectfully, and refusing to work. And the cure included a kind of hard labor that sent vitalized blood to the brain to give liberty to the mind. The Jamaica Lunatic Asylum Law of 1972, <clears throat> not going to the detail of the history, but this is when the Lunatic Asylum was built. But it was built on the basis of arrest by the police and custodialization. This was the the what was worked in the law. And it produced the long stay wards of the Bellevue Hospital, the custodial long stay wards, just like the ones you have in Europe, just like the ones you have in America, just like the ones you have in, in, in Africa, because they've built the model around the entire world, the same model. And they have tried, no, <laughs> this man, Len Smith, he has just written a book about Jamaican lunatic asylum. And he says, the conclusion is inescapable that measures to remove, sequestrate, and care for the insane were a central element to Britain's civilizing mission. You remember that word we talked about earlier on? The civilizing mission of the Europeans for the black people. But that's absolute rubbish, Len Smith. That's rubbish. Because the contemporary mission is, is almost forgotten because it was just a a word to just plaster over what was going on. So now, pioneering psychohistoriography and cultural therapy in Jamaica, which is part now of the decolonization process of what we have been doing for ourselves. The birth of PCT, as we call it, was, it happened really in, in 1978, with mag magnificent irations this hyper-historiographic cultural therapy in decolonizing psychiatry in Jamaica. I grew up in colonial Jamaica. In other words, when I lived five minutes away from the military base, where there were 5,000 troops, white British troops and their children who lived there. The children went to school with me. We went to the same school. They used to send them in a lorry and park them outside my house every single day. So I knew them well. The reality is those of us who grew up under colonialism understand it. Those of us now who never grew up under it didn't understand 
still don't really realize the history of what was, had taken place. But this is Bellevue, 1962. The first black psychiatrist in Jamaica is a man named Hopeton Edward Bond. He was the first man in charge of the black man in the Caribbean in charge of the lunatic asylum. Paradoxically, he was my granduncle. He was my grandfather's brother. I was telling you earlier that black, black people, all the descendants of, of Africans enslaved in, in, the, in the New World, in Jamaica, emerged from the plantation. They came out of the Cane Peace, but some people came out faster than others. So for example, like my grandfather's family came out within 40 years of emancipation, they were now going to tertiary education and becoming professional people. So, so, but there are some people that my, my wife is now still teaching. My wife's name, for, uh, by the way, is Hillary Robertson Hickling, and I call her HRH because she's my queen. And she, <laughs> she, she <clears throat> will, say, will tell you that there are just, there are sometimes only now that there are some of the, the families are just emerging into tertiary institutions for the first time. And I was the senior medical officer between 76 and 82. But my, my real passion in Jamaica was in, in the theater. And I worked as the stage manager with the National Dance Theater Company. And as I watched the technicians putting up the, the set here, I was, I was reminded of my days as a stage manager, traveling around the world with, with putting up the, the sets and the sceneries for the National Dance Theater Company. In fact, I played here in Germany in 1977. We played in West Germany and we played here in Berlin as well. So I've been around the world, but as a musician, as a technician in, in entertainment, not, not as a psychiatrist, but that's a completely different uh, story. Rex Nettleford, who's my mentor and the artist director, he also was a tremendous academician and he became the vice chancellor of our university. In other words, it was, he set the example for people like me that it's possible that you can marry arts and culture and entertainment with professional work and keep them, marry them together and work, work them together and rise to the toppest level of academic achievement in the world. He was the person who taught me that and I know, I'm now trying to teach my children that. This is what I saw when I went to Bellevue the custodialization of people. The primary mission of British psychiatry during colonialization was custodialization and control. Don't, don't ever forget that. For example, Alexander Bedard was a, 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 a preacher, a revival preacher, <clears throat> who was locked up in Bellevue Hospital. He was arrested, first of all, for treason, then locked up because the treason charge wouldn't stick. Why? Because he had a huge following of black people following his church who were demanding repatriation. They wanted to go home to Africa and they were demanding from the British state that they be paid money to get them back to Africa. And that's why they locked him up. So in other words, what the British used these lunatic asylums for was to lock up people who, had, who were rebelling against them, who, were, who had Usually, it was in some kind of religious form that was creating this rebellion. Leonard Howell now um, was, was the person who actually started the Rastafarian movement in, in 1932. And he too was locked up in the mental hospital. But he, he, he announced the emergence of Rastafari as the anti-colonial political and religious movement in Jamaica where he recognized Haile Selassie I as the, as the leader, as the, as the leader of the Rastafarian movement and, and the, the, the black man's God in embodiment. Ja Rastafari was, was the embodiment of this Rastafarian movement that started in 1932. The lunatic asylum was used for psychocultural repression by British colonialism. The Rastafari were viewed as mad people, forcibly detained in the lunatic asylum 
and their dreadlocks shaved. Marcus Garvey was also a very powerful black leader at the time, but he was the first cultural therapist because he was demanding that black people have their own religion, have their own language, have their own names, have their own art and music, have their own authority systems, have their own social systems, and have their own economic systems. He was the first political cultural therapist in the world. He was also a playwright. He wrote seven plays. He had a place called Edelweiss Park where he would, he would put on shows for the people. This is in the 1920s. This is in the time of the, the, the height of European colonialism around the world. I wrote a paper with Ezra Griffiths, who is a professor of psychiatry at Yale, on the clinical perspectives of Rastafari. And we recognize that clinicians in Jamaica and other countries with large Afro-Caribbean populations are confronted with challenges to their clinical skills posed by the task of assessing young middle-class men and women who have undergone transformation from the images of their parents' ideals into practicing Rastafari, the business of, dis of dissociative reaction, normal dissociative reactions. Ray Prince, who was a professor of transcultural psychiatry at McGill in 1969, at a meeting of the APA, American Psychiatric Association, he said Rastafari was a product of delusional cultism. The Rasta man in Jamaica nearly numb him. But, excuse me, they nearly ate him. <laughs> of course, it, it just wasn't true. These, this is, these were the Rastafarians. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Bob Marley, the Honorable. Ari Kiev said, told Ray Prince that he was chatting rubbish and challenged his view and said that it, uh, misunderstanding of the group promotes the false idea that Rastafari beliefs are more unusual or deviant than the concepts of other religious movements. Rastafari, the word is love, self and others, the I and I, word, sound and power. That's the philosophy of the Rastafarian movement. The word is love, one love, word, sound and power, I and I, self and others. I apologize for breaking up of the words, but when you transport a PowerPoint from one to another, it gets a little so around 1977 now, right after the West German trip with the National Dance Theatre Company, I had, a, I had a, a party at my home and the manager of this band came to me and said, listen, I have this group of virtuoso musicians and they're having a hard time understanding the business of keeping together. Can you do some work with them, both as a psychologist and as an entertainer? Is that telling me to shut up? <laughs> and so I had a three-month a three psychohistoriographic cultural therapy workshop with them and produced the play Explanations. Explanations meaning the explanation of the plantation. We are good at, at neologistic words, and we have used neologistic words as weapons forever and ever. In our, in our travel. I could tell you a lot more about this explanation story, but again, we don't have the time. For example, the words of, of, of Bunny Ruggs out of the play, where it was uh, 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 a, a slaver said, bought him on the Ivory Coast, I did, 350 guineas. No special skills, this one. Mandigo stock, fine specimen, 4,000 guineas. Good on horses, these are. That's a piece of the script. But Rasta just can't suffer so. Rasta have the power to make suffering go, to turn negative to positive, my brethren. So put on your thinking cap and clap your eye upon the map of Africa, then slip through the eye of the needle and step into the land of the free. So psychohistoriographic cultural therapy was really 
pioneered at the Bellevue Hospital. Again, this is just showing the total institution, the Goffman-esque total institution, where lunacy was a crime punishable by police arrest and incarceration. And we produced this concept called psychohistoriography. And I, I, again, I tell you, I've not only done the work, but I've written about it. This book is now published by Jessica Kingsley, and it's avail available online on Amazon. So there you go. <laughs> nice, you like that. <laughs> Psychohistoriography Psycho is a phase in intellectual history, <clears throat> that phase which records what men have, at different times have known and believed about the past which have made to their knowledge seem to them to be relevant and their beliefs to be true. Elsa Gvar, who was a professor of history at UW, said, the method of analysis of historical documents to determine a given society's outlook, ideology, and beliefs, and to identify dynamics and social forces that compel change. But my argument was, hey, we, we black people at that time didn't have anybody doing any writing for us. They wouldn't allow us to go to school. They wouldn't allow us to go to university. We weren't writing. So what about our memories too? What about our memories can be analyzed historiographically as well? So I said, hey, you analyze the psychological histories, the anecdotes that are in people's mind. And thus came the birth of psychohistoriography, which uses group psychological dynamics in the collective analysis of group history and behavior as recorded in people's memory, as exemplified in the oral tradition, as identified by Ernest Bradford from, from 1983. Ernest Bradford is in one of Savi's books. I saw it last night. And this was at the time. But he was here. Eh? Right here. He was here. <laughs> well, she's a great friend, and we, we visit her place every, uh, every, every year. This was going on in the time of democratic socialism. So in other words, there was a political background to the, product, the production of this decolonization stuff. It didn't just happen by accident. It didn't just happen by magic. It was during the period of democratic socialism of Michael Manley in that time. And what we did is we got the, all, the, all the workers and the patients to gather in a room like this, like we are here, maybe 300 of them, and to discuss the history that were in our heads, not what, the, what Len Smith was writing about us, but what they remembered and what the, the stories that were passed on about how the mental hospital was written and, and built. And, and we, we, this is the kind of reasoning in a large group that we had. And out of that, we built the, the dialectic, the mirror of murder. Murder's madness, murder's badness, murder of war. In Jamaica, the guerrillas who fought with the mind, the government sought them mad. The guerrillas who fought with guns, the government sought them bad and locked them up in prisons and mental hospitals. The madness, badness dialectic, which is the basis of psychohistoriographic um, analysis in the mental hospital. And this is, how we, this is a chart which has been broken down as to how we did it, how the cycle historiogram was produced. First of all, you had a timeline in the middle, and then you had the madness, badness, the timelines, and you started at wherever you wanted to start. We started at 1,000 years uh, AD and to the present moment, <clears throat> and you had the African cultural heritage above and the European cultural heritage below. And based on the anecdotes that came out, of the historical reality, you then put them on the chart, you then wrote them up on the chart and see and where all of the ideas clustered, where all of the anecdotes clustered, um, temporarily and, and, diagon and dialectically. And we, the same thing for the, the history of the mental hospital. As to the in, and of course, now we then put it all together. No, then we did the music line and the cultural line the cultural aspects of the music in the time. And then we put all graphs together and it came out as one big graph. And based on this big graph now, you could draw theme lines, which you use these theme lines to create the pageant, to write the script, because they then we gave them names. 
because they then reflected what was going on in a dialectical fashion in the historical analysis of the Jamaican mental hospital and madness at the time. This is called the psychohistoriogram, and we'll be, hope we'll be doing one of these tomorrow when we do the workshop. So this is what it looks like. White Europe, discovery of delusion, invaders. Delusion of ownership, we call them thieves. Institutionalization of genocide, we call them murderers. Slavery, the ultimate delusion, we call them plunderers. Delusion of capitalism led to our poverty. And early encapsulation of the delusion, fight for emancipation and freedom. Depersonalization of the delusion, migration and indenture. Contemporary encapsulation, independence, movement, the empire fights back, intifada, and then know what's going on now. Make America white again. We don't know what the balance on that one is, but there must be a balance. That's Trump's world. But hey, we've been here before. We've been through this fight before. So that's, that's psychohistoriographic psychoanalysis of black people. The master's tool will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never allow us to bring about genuine change. So these are the five C's of, of cultural therapy. Circling, centering, culturing, cognitive catalysis, capacity building. And let's see if we can understand what these mean. First of all, circling, derived from the African kotla. Then centering, where you, you teach people uh, mindfulness exercises to control impulses. And then culturing to put thoughts into the local culture. And then stage four, which is the collective poesis, which Debian Chambers will be talking to you about tomorrow night, um, the word, sound, and power. And the proud tribe of Africa enslaved in the new world. This was the magnificent iteration which came out of this. Stage five, capacity building, and, and dramaturgy. But at the same time, no, we decided we didn't have anywhere to put on this show, so we decided to build our own theater. And in this natural grove of lignum vitae trees, we planned to build a theater. That was the stage manager and me. I couldn't go anywhere without building a theater. I love building theaters. So we, we built one ourselves, out of wood and bamboo. And the patients moved the brick from an old ward and put them on the floor. That was the, the garden theater we built, <clears throat> 1978, situated in a lignum vitae grove in Bellevue Hospital. The seats and walls were made of bamboo. This was a foyer. Hey, there were carvings on the trees by the patients. The theater in the round, the theater in the round. What did we see this afternoon? Was the theater of the absurd? I beg your pardon. <laughs> the capacity building, the embodiment, the cognition and dramaturgy, cultural therapy at Bellevue Mental Hospital, rehearsals with patients and staff, the patients coming out to watch the, the, what was going on. It was a tremendous therapeutic thing for them. Um, told a story about how British colonialism used madness and the perception of madness to silence resistance against slavery colonialism and oppression. The descendants of Africans enslaved in the New World. That was a band we created. Slaves don't get mad. You're crazy. Whoever heard of a mad slave? Ha! We would just have to exterminate him like a mad dog. And even though bald head now didn't know now, him still control I. For him control the Donny and all, all the land up till that time, madness did not exist in relation to the black man. He was just a slave. So here you go, lunatic asylum law again. We put the enactment of the stage stuff, of the, of the, the court stuff on stage. We, 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 we had different themes. This one is of a mad woman talking about her sexual experiences. 10 picked the man to breed me and left me with. Just give me one 
God, just me, one, and God in the whole blood clot universe. My father is a pretty black man with tall, pretty straight hair. Not like that dirty old nigger. Irish and drummers, the performers, magnificent Irishians. Don't bother think say them free because them love me. I man fight back and struggle, and it's them have to pay for it. People from the community came in, in droves. It became a community center in the mental hospital. The mental hospital where people used to be afraid of lied to their lives. It now became an entertainment center for downtown Kingston. It was a remarkable transformation that was taking place. Of course, I wrote about it. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote about it in the American journals. Because if you don't write it, you haven't done it. And then no, there was a change in government. The politics changed and the right wings came in. And the right wing government ripped down the garden theater and discombobulated the whole rehabilitation, decolonization movement. And of course, I quickly exited the mental hospital because I, at that time I was a pariah. But cultural therapy has existed in spite of them. And all of these changes have ex existed in spite of them. And I've written about it in many areas. But many of you have seen these things. So now, we come to the issue about taming psychosis. Because in that period of the 1970s onwards, we took on the business of psychosis. Because that was the biggest problem we had in the country. We had these mad people walking on the streets. We had high levels of madness. And we had to find a way to deal with it. And how did we deal with it? First of all, we set up rehabilitation services within the mental hospital. Therapy, the community principle. We, we, here's the mental hospital, patients going in and leaving. When you bypass them to the community, that's what we did. We started treating them in the community at home. And then here now, we use rehabilitation, and that X mean that is when the mental hospital lock up. But it, it's reduced from, let me show you the file, it reduced from 3,000 from 3, patients. When I, when I took over, and it was 1,200 when I left, and it's now about 500. So we have had a gradual deinstitutionalization of the mental hospital, opposed to what's happening in America and Europe, where you have had the community practice, but you haven't had the gradual, you just threw them out on the street. I know, I've worked in Europe, hey. So this is what we did in, in, in Jamaica. We treated, we started treating psychotic people in open medical wards and general hospitals. And when I tell people about that in Europe, they cannot believe me. Somebody with a psychosis being treated beside somebody with a myocardial infarction or beside somebody with a pulmonary embolus. They cannot believe me. That's what we have done. The acute ward, the psychosis treated, m m merged psychiatry with general medicine. So in other words, when you look at what happened now, the, the red line is the, um, the trans institutionalization. The green line are the prison beds which have stayed the same, and the yellow lines are the mental hospital beds which have gone down. And if you look at like what has happened in America, it's quite different. After they threw out the, the after John Kennedy produced the community mental health treatment here, no, all the, the mental patients have ended up in the prisons. That's where they are. Same thing here in Germany, same thing in Italy, same thing in England. I know I've worked here. I know and you can't tell me nothing about it. We have shown that there's a superior outcome of patients with schizophrenia treated in the open general medical wards compared with treated in mental hospital or psychiatric units. <clears throat> We're coming to the end now here, so just allow me to finish. This has been replicated in the Cochrane Library. Nobody has replicated this outside of Jamaica. It's only we in Jamaica have produced this. So you look at the, the admissions now, red. You see that blue line? All hospitals, psychiatric admissions. You see the red line? Bellevue Hospital, steady. Hardly anybody going. 20% of admissions go to Bellevue, no. 
The purple line, open medical wards, that's where the admissions are going. And the green line, medical, um, open medical wards in general hospitals. So it means that we have a gradual deinstitutionalization process. And we have looked at it scientifically. We have done the studies and we have done the writings. We have done the publications. And we have moved into the community. In other words, we treat our psychotic patients in the community. It's an amazing thing to me when I heard um, the, 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 the stories about the, 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 the mad people in, in, in North London earlier on, our dear friends were telling us. I've, I've worked in, in those places. I worked in Birmingham for five years. In Jamaica now, the amount of mad people you see on the street is maybe one a week. When I took it over in the 1970s, it was like 40, 50 a day all over the city. In other words, we have tamed psychosis. We haven't, eradic we haven't eradicated it, but we just don't have the resources to provide the, the full thing. And here is what it is. We have a 24 response time to acute mental illness. 250,000 severely mentally admissions to general hospitals. Severe mental health clinics seen annually and the mild to moderate people seen by the general practitioners. <coughs> you asked me to tell you the story, you know, so I'm telling you the story. Soon finish now. I've worked in New Zealand, so I know what's going on there. I've worked in Birmingham, in, in North Birmingham. And the, the work that I did in North Birmingham, we won the Nye Bevan Award because we showed the, the white English people how to treat psychosis in North Birmingham. So we won the prize. I'm not going into details with you, but I have the details here. And so the complex trauma now, I became the professor at university. And Fran Franz Fernand told us all about these issues. Here is the complex trauma now. Watch it. This is the complex trauma of slavery, all about the various things. And that coming out of Europe, and that leads to the problems in slaves. And of course, this is transmitted by intergenerational transmission of epigenetics. And now the effects of complex trauma on the enslaved, again, look at it here. What happens is that there were some people who became resilient and started adaptive coping mechanisms. They, they started getting better. Some people got sick, but some people got adaptively coping and became, I know you really want to come out now, so I'm really going to try and rush it. Um, personality disorder, big issue. I did a lot of work on that and set up Caramensa, which produced public health model. And this is how, how Caramensa works. You have the things that you can look it up yourself. And this is the bread in the oven, bacon. One case you study. You can't go bacon. Bread in the oven, bacon. In the city. Here comes the road boy, Jamaican. Petty theft, conduct disorder, gang membership, road boy, dissociation, erected and committed for murder. Look at me, boy. Sleep with me, boy. Post-slavery society, poverty. At Ocean Eleven, rock bad picnic. And no rude boys are go wheel. Call them out of jail. Rude boys cannot feel. Call them must get real. Oh, 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 oh. Them a loot, them a shoot, them a wheel. 
Shanty Town. I'm a loot, I'm a shoot, I'm a wheel. Shanty Town. All right, this just shows you that we have developed our own nosology. We are bypassing DSM-4, DSM-5. We have our own nosology, our own language as to how we, we describe these conditions. Complex trauma. Know what we're doing. We have done it. We have studied it. This is the problem now. This is the problem we have now. The kicking them, the children, fighting, violence in schools. And this is why we developed the overstanding of all of the problems and how to fix them. And that's how the dreamer world thing went. This is just one started working with us then about borderline pathology in, in kids. And we set up the Dreamer World project. What is Dreamer World? Cultural therapy. What is cultural therapy? It is using a psychotherapeutic check method that translates complex psychological trauma into psychological in, and negates the complex trauma. We did it first in Almond Town. We set up the, the five C's. You're going to make up your own life. Give your name, Making up their own planet, give it a name. The things you want, the things you don't want, you, you, you leave out. <laughs> and you create your own situation of in the children. And we did it with first. We did it first of all with one school, then we did it with four schools. And we won the prize in England, the Dream of World Project, as the best um, modern treatment facility across the world. Jane McGrath said, we dis discussed if we had been won over by Prof, Prof Hickling's charisma and not the project. Certainly not. We all agree that it was simply the best. We use the Akenbach system and we did all the testing on it. We have, we have the sands. I can't show you the sands now because <clears throat> we just don't have the time. These were the hundred bad behaving children who we turned them around like this. They are now the best behaving children using the cultural therapy method. So the theory of change is that you can move it up until you take it to the whole country. And I'm trying to get through these slides quickly because I know that you want to move on. But I really just have to finish up. I can't just leave it, leave it so. We have been reducing the fights in schools. We have set up behavior modification issues. We're dealing with flogging. We're setting it up now for 87 schools around the country. We know we're teaching the teachers to do it. We're teaching, the, circling the classroom, circling the children. Don't tell me I want to act it out. So when you get it, you're a little bit. We had all the results. I can't share the results, but we have published them. So this was started out with one school. Then we went to four schools. 
Then we went to 35 schools. Then we went to 70 schools. Now we have gone to 87 schools in the eastern end. And this is a proof of concept, scale up, transition, 87 schools. And that's the number of children that we have worked with. And that's the cost of it. Started out at 3,000 US dollars per child. Now it's down to 130 US dollars per child. So the conclusions are, it targets all institutional levels of mental health prevention. And this is what this work was done in Harvard about how the developmental issues work. Well, we have followed that because we have shown that what we have, we have created social engineering processes that can deal with every single part of the range that the Harvard University team has produced. And so the only question is, how will we ever pay? We know how to decolonize. We have worked out the solution. But how do we pay? Because we know this is what happens when you get aid from the first world. It drip, drip, drip down, and you get nothing. And they use you as a ashtray. Without the slave trade, 72% of Africa's income gap with the rest of the world would not exist today. Germans know about reparations. Weimar, Germany, and war reparations after World War I. This is after World War II. We don't know about reparations, too. I'm telling you now, Europe owes us money. The UWI is talking about it. We want reparations now. You, you give us an IOU, now you want to collect, because we have things to do with the money. And there's a struggle in Europe as to whether it should be reparations now or reparations no. So we have to be able to reschool our country to continue to create the wonderful things that we're doing. And I want to end by a poem that I wrote in one of the um, psychohistoriographic cultural therapies in Bellevue <clears throat> called Mind Chains. It's very hard to tell of enslavement of the mind. I feel to scream and shout and yell of what I know. No solace can I find, no peace within mankind, until first you shatter the chains which bind. Our experience is unique in the sameness of history. And in blackness comes the mystery of the paradox of the clique. Who taught us to say last week when they really mean first strong, they do not know where we belong because they do not realize that history goes not backwards as life moves always forwards and words become as fetters to die blind foes to our minds. For the people will always struggle and their minds will always bubble if Bakraman control the land and chief of all the power. It will come within a twinkle as the people's smile will wrinkle when all of we will unite and to see that there is but one fight not killing one another, sister killing brother, but to trample down the dragon and to pilot your own wagon, destroying the plantation, that alien creation designed to keep the poor always sleeping on the floor without clothes, without land, and without culture. Unloved brothers and sisters, one heart. Thank you, Fred. I think people would like to ask you many questions, but we are two and maybe more than two hours late. Uh, I just want to remember that tomorrow we are actually holding a psychohistoriographic psycho -historiographic workshop downstairs at Savi. It was, it's already overbooked, but um, just know that uh, we are not only talking about it, but doing it. Not only uh, writing about it, but also doing it. So. Um, I think somebody else was meant to introduce Dorote Munianetza. So maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing who is introducing, so I will do it. The performance piece that we're going to assist now is called, is entitled When They Come. Dorote, um, 
Dorothée is a Rwandan and British artist living in Marseille. She's a multidisciplinary artist employing music, text, and movement to deal with rupture as a dynamic force. She already was with us recently for our project Rhythm Analysis. Uh, she also published a text in that book. I think we give space to her now. Mm. 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 Hmm. Never Come <laughs> 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 No, could we kill Mutas? The tongue of Jazz, mother of the park. Look what I was going to say. Yes, sir. Who go over the end? You You
flowers don't grow there, grow there anymore, anymore. Where are the bees? Now? Where are the bees? Where are the bees now? Where are the bees? Where are the Where bees? are the bees now? Where are the bees now? I need this louder, please. Well above when above and I Where are the bees? Where are the bees? Where are the bees, ladies and gentlemen? The fleurs sont parties. Les corps même sont pourris. Je danse seul. Avec elle, dans les champs de ma mémoire, peuplé d'ombre et de lumière et de ténèbres. Where are the bees now? Where are the bees? Where are the bees now? the bees now oh. Petite fille
when they come for you? What you gonna do when they come?
Iyo bije baravuga bati ugomba kwiruka bagerageza kuza kugufata naho aba kuri mu ugomba kugerageza ukiruka ugomba kwiruka iruka Why 
think it's just a reading session. Okay. Okay. Cool. Wow. Okay, so I'm still reeling from that, I have to say. So intense, Dorothy Muyanyaneza. So next up, we have Yota Mombaka, a reading session called So When I'm Gone, I Shall Be in the Air. This is a poem about death and disappearance, and it is also a philosophical consideration of infinity. This is a song about a community of ghosts, and it is also a statement about Yota hearing voices. This is a picture of a shattered glass ceiling, and it is also an affirmation of nothing. It is a word on wordlessness, and it is also a letter to Bob Kaufman and to whom it may concern. Yota is a writer, performance artist, and researcher, a non-binary bicha, born and raised in the northeast of Brazil, who writes, performs, and investigates on the relations between monstrosity and humanity, queer studies, decolonial turns, political intersectionality, anti-colonial justice, redistribution of violence, visionary fictions, the end of the world, and tensions among ethics, aesthetics, art, and politics in the knowledge productions of the global south of the south. It is my pleasure to bring Yota on board and on stage. Thank you. Oops. Yeah. Thank you for waiting, for your patience. I hope it's worthy. So dad, when I'm gone, I shall be in the air. This is a poem about death and disappearance. And this is also a philosophical consideration of eternity. This is a song about the community of ghosts. And this is also a statement on me hearing voices. This is a picture of a shattered glass ceiling, and this is also an affirmation of nothing. This is a glimpse of an impossible form of justice, and this is also a gesture towards the grounding of such impossibility. This is a dance at the end of times. This is an invocation of what has to be announced. This is a reading of a book that is burning. This is a burnt voice holding that fire. This is a word on wordlessness. And this is a letter to Bob Kaufman and to whom it may concern. Someone said that you woke up that day as if you knew you were about to exit. You washed your mouth. You cleaned up, up your bedroom, you watered the plants, you baited yourself, you dressed in white and left a glass of water in your bedside table. You died. I light a candle for calling you. I pray using your words. Hear me now. Hear me now. Always hear somehow. I am thinking about you while I try to make sense of death as transmutation, while I try to tune myself with the heat of that candle. The fact that the world is burning enters the room where I live. I wake up to the pervasiveness of fire, surrounded by its flames and ashes, by its endangered species and displaced communities. The death it unfolds takes hold of the words. It crosses the narrative, burning ground, filling every silence and every voice with its massive, overwhelming indeterminacy. It is not a dream. I cannot simply escape fire towards reality, for reality itself is burning. I call you again without saying your name. I want to sit opposite to you, to look at your fingers dancing. Where do your words transit? How do they cross? The sound of your voice responds from a distance. I can already feel your presence manifested somewhere in the depth. But you are not here yet. So I read you. 
white tiger. I hear y'all hum on the drone, flowing on beds of fresh snow and springs, flowing back to the nether source. The truth is an empty bowl of rice. Those cat hold men who cage you shall melt in the summer sun, for they are ugly bars who the echo who echo the sting of unrolling rivers in the dry, cracked bed. I read myself. I watch the video of you dancing. I try to follow your hands. My attention goes from your fingers to the things they point, point to, somewhere outside the frame. In the description of the video on YouTube, someone says this is one of the few hair footage of your existence. It was your birthday. I wonder how old are you? I wonder how long you live. I watch you stumbling, and for a second, I have the sensation that your instability announces an entirely other form of steadiness. Then you enter the room wearing your sailor hat and bringing a tiny red rose in your pocket. The fire spreads out of the candle, and my first reaction is to yell, let the sun in. And so I read you again. I am the eternity that was held by the ostrich egg. The magnificent December is now no longer hidden. The sun, I'm alone, is present forever. I get back to myself. Eternity could be said to contain a great amount of time, but I would rather stick with another reading of what it means. Eternity as the descriptor of a duration that exists outside of time, as a temporality that exceeds the counting and therefore cannot be contained by any measure other than the ostrich egg, which is the poem. You are that eternity that was held by the poem, so you, like the sun, is present forever. Even when forgotten, even when erased, even when they need to call you Black Humbo in order to unallege you. You vanish right in front of their eyes, and yet you never cease to be there. I read you. Someone who I am is no one. Something I have done is nothing. Some place I have been is nowhere. I am not me. What of the answers I must find questions for? All these strange streets I must find cities for. Thank God the beatniks. I read myself. I have never lived anywhere near home. I feel tired of most things. I just want to lay down and wait. I just want to give up my weight. I just want to stop this right now. May this intense repetition twist into a form of multiplication and nutrition. If instead of being held by the negative, one could channel negativity as a thunder that cuts the cage of the tiger and mine and yours truly. To be what is no one, as to do what is nothing, as to go what is nowhere, as in being what is not a being. Maybe the affirmation of nothing is a constitutive gesture of black anti-colonial possibility. For it is an evasion of both objecthood, outer determination, subalternity, and subjecthood, self-determination, sovereignty. The poem, which is the ostrich egg that contains the sun and therefore eternity, is the continent of such extrapolation. The poet is most likely the extrapolation itself. I read you. In a universe of cells, who is not in jail? Jailers. In a world of hospitals, who is not sick? Doctors. A golden sardine is swimming in my head. Oh, we know some things, man, about some things, like jazz and jails and God. Saturday is a good day to go to jail. I read myself. I wanted to burn the language I was taught. This language in which every word is scheming for the reproduction of our unintelligibility. 
we have simultaneously made as an incognito and driven into a fight for language. In Odette and Bruno's play, I read a sentence about only having the language that replicates our inexistence. It was written in the wall with the language that replicates our inexistence. There is a scene in my head and I'm scared. In the last three days, I've been trapped in a negative spiral. Pessimism is just as toxic as the belief in the truth, in the future, and in the good. If we at least knew how to hack the effects of anxiety towards other direction, how to learn it otherwise. But one grows sick and then feel disposable. We are always in the threshold or at the corner of anything. As an homage to Conceição Evaristo, us agreed not to die. We also need them to agree not to kill us. I know they aren't just outside, didn't notice when they settled, but I can feel them moving right at the spine of all of my traumas. They are, they are the ones who die us in spite of what us have agreed. In the meantime, my ex-therapist paused somewhere. You are bigger than your trauma. My ex-lover, in the day I was harassed by an old Portuguese lady on the street, told me the exact same thing. She called the police and I said, Mr. Policeman, I am bigger than you. I am bigger than all the Portuguese old ladies who have learned to read my body as a threat. I am bigger than economic fluctuations, than messed up migration, and I am bigger than my collapsed walk. They feel that I owe something is so hackering, even if it no longer stops me to tell them, then again, always then, that I owe nothing, that the debt is their heritage. I wrote with blood in the invasor's promenade, you owe us. My prophecy says that just like us, our ghosts are coming to collect. They are already on their way. To write the sentence, the skin of the country does not guarantee that the struggle against the few, that I am the one who owes something, will cease. It is just a form of cutting the word, and the word is my trauma. Am I bigger than my trauma? Because if the word that is my trauma never stops doing its work, then be bigger than the word is my counter work. Sometimes I feel that the void that swallows me every morning and every night is a continuation of the void in my bank account. I feel that the self-destructive hush that consumes me from noon to the evening is inversely proportional to the assassin calm of the Servicio de Estrangeiros e Fronteiras. I am bigger than these mathematics. I am bigger than the Servicio de Estrangeiros y Fronteiras. Once he said me that I should get in there as a ox in a porcelain shop. Yesterday, after seeing me sad, a bishop said that sadness will always occur to the bishop's bombas. The price you pay for destroying the whole shit that fucks you up is to notice too late that the explosion also lead to your destruction. I was pushed to the extremes and I was, I was soon there. As the bishop said, we are exterminated exterminators. Life is short, fatalism. We are alone with the pain of our position. If I take a sack and pull my head outside of the spiral in which I'm drowning, I get to an immediate conclusion. Or I stop, or it stops me. I read you. Painter, paint me a crazy jail, mad water, color, cells. Poet, how old is suffering? Write it, write it in yellow lead. God, make me a sky on my glass ceiling. I need stars now to lead through this atmosphere of shrieks and private hells, entrances and exits, in, out, up, down. The civic seesaw. Hear me now. Hear me now. Always hear somehow. 
I read you. Shadows I see forming on the wall, pictures of desire protected from my own eyes. After spending all night constructing a dream, morning came and blinded me with light. Now I seek, I seek among mountains of crushed eggshells for that goddamn dream I never wanted. I read you. Caught in imaginary webs of conscience, I weep over my acts, yet believe. I read myself. Maybe the question that is text and tales could be formulated as follows. What if instead of integrity, self-consciousness, self-esteem, and self-determination, there is a fundamental sense of brokenness that dislodges effectively the human from its podium? What if we could think on such inconsistencies, such ways of being too broken to fit in any that identitarian and representational co coherent regime of self-narration as the condition for a form of presence that precludes the bio-necropolitical grammars of time and its regulatory effects of what we understand as life and death? What if from the margins of the great universal we, human, able, white, normal, heteronormative, and cisgender, there are other forms of engendering collectivity that are expressed in and through the break? How to inhabit such vulnerability? And how to create in the tense, contested space of the lives threatened by systemic violence? a connection not based in the integrity of the subject, but in its inescapable brokenness. To talk about the break, one needs to escape the logical structures that operate according to, up to one position, opposition between the individual and the collective. This is not about breaking the individualist neoliberal logic towards an embracing of the common. It is neither an affirmation of such logic. What I'm trying to articulate is a singular, singularity positioned underneath the individual, for its individuality and personhood is undone by systemic forms of violence, and a collectivity that always already operates underneath the common, for its unintelligibility releases precisely what the modern colonial logics of social cohesion produce as the impossible. Neither an I nor a we as internally coherent entities. I hereby invoke a form of presence that escape the very gesture of apprehension activated by this text. I invoke a force that is neither the subject nor the word, though it crosses both. It is possible that this text end without offering a sufficiently well put definition on what I have been articulating as the break. Maybe it is precisely this resistance to definition that defines the break less as an as an autonomous entity and more as a fugitive, indeterminate force. Thus, the break cannot be defined because it cannot be held within itself. When a glass shatters, its pieces run without coordination or any plausible order. Having this image in mind and finally getting closer to a proper yet provisional definition, I would say that the break is not expressed through the glass splinters. Heather, it vibrates in the abrupt, erratic, and chaotic movement of shattering. Nonetheless, how such description would propitiate any expression of togetherness. If the break breaks a certain notion of integrity and instability, how then it can provide the ground for the gathering of the forces, entities, and existences it entails? If it vibrates through demolition, what politics of affinity could be engendered right there, at and across the break? This is not easy, for it does not come without discomfort and pain. 
to ignite the possibility of a collective unlikely formed after the movement of a shattering will always demand an openness to the flows of blood as to the heat, of, as, as to the heat waves of the particular pulsation of the wounds that are the world. After all, to unsettle this world in these wounds is a way of being together in the break, as well as a form of mapping among the pieces of a glass shattered and impossible nexus, i.e. the expression of an unsuspected collectiv collectivity. It has to do with the work of breed in high-fied atmospheres, of walking over unstable pavements, and of being alone with the discomfort of moving as a gang. The discomfort of once together to touch the break of each other. I read you. Now I see the night, silently overwhelming day. I read myself. I think our best chance is to cross the great night without turning the lights on. I read you, sitting here writing things on paper instead of sticking the pencil into the air. I read myself, what has no space is everywhere. I read you, finally. There have been too many years in this short span of mine my soul demands a cave of its own, like the Jain God. Yes, yet I must make it go on, hard like jazz, glowing in this dark plastic jungle, land of long night, chilled. My navel is a button to push when I want inside out. Am I not more than a mess of entrails and rough tissue? Must I break my bones? drink my wine diluted blood? Should I dredge old sadness from my chest? Not again. All those ancient balls of fire, hotly swallowed, let them lie. Let me spit breath mist of introspection, beats of me. So dead, when I'm gone, I shall be in the air. Thank you very much. to be two hours late, but uh, let me turn this off. Okay. Um, wait, let me turn this off first. Uh, it's off? Okay, okay. So, yeah, basically, um, let us end this night with a word of gratitude. So, thank you very much for staying with us for the for this entire evening and some of you maybe also morning uh, for the workshop. So yeah, thank you very much also to Bennett, to Ray, um, Boilerhead and Rana his team, the Silent Green team here, to all our dear participants who came from Kingston, Johannesburg, England, everywhere, you guys, Neukölln. And um, yeah, tonight, uh, actually today was the 25th and it was the new decade in the uh, Chinese um, calendar, I believe, the new year of the metal rat. And right now we have also another um, special date, which is the birthday actually by Sia Bonga. Yes, I say his name, I'm a wicked woman. Happy birthday, Sia Bonga. <laughs> and yeah. So this is actually the last performance by um, Yahima and Sia Bonga. And yeah, we very much thank you again for being with us, for caring through this evening. And we're very much looking forward for this last performance and contribution. Thanks for staying with us.
we have to excuse Inyabonga because as Lena already mentioned, today, now, it's his birthday, so of course, uh, yes. <laughs> exactly, happy, 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 happy birthday. Maybe while he's preparing himself, I um, mention something about this piece uh, that was meant to be uh, a collaboration, I mean, uh, um, a a group uh, piece uh, with The Brother Moves On and um, an artist, uh, Nolan Dennis, uh, but that is going to be improvised in another way because we have, we have some uh, visa issues as we explained earlier. But I want to read to you what the trauma room is. Uh, so for The Brother Moves On, the trauma room is a spatial and sonic environment developed in conjunction with A New Myth, the album that they produced in 2013. Trauma Room borrows its name from emergency medical care facilities which deal with the most extreme injuries. In the reworking of this idea, the Trauma Room becomes a place for sonic and spatial collective care, performing acts of rebuilding and repairing the social body through exploring the dimensions of a new myth. Trauma Room consists of a musical note, the band, uh, a visual note, the notations and a video graphic, consisting of a video collage of projected, um, a video collage projected onto the wall, and a live drawing annotating walls of the space in response to the band. The audience, as well, is an active um, participant encouraged to occupy the space according to their own desire, and there is no prescribed sitting, uh, um, sitting or place for the audience. So. You understand why we invited them. Happily. Thank you for staying this late. The first song is called Hamadlizioyamu, which translated means Go My Heart. It was my dad's favorite song. My dad died when I was 10. I think the truest way of saying it is my dad passed when I was 10 because he's been present through my life. dad was not a religious man, but he believed in God. I 
I guess this is why this was his favorite song. It speaks of, go my heart, go to heaven. Because there is no peace on earth. My dad is why I ended up a singer.
burning of the republic it is always the flattened mountain that performs the first act of self-immolation then the shacks then the shacks too close a mouth with too many teeth jostling for attention and protest of their own impoverishment and the people within them follow an artwork in schools we can't afford and burning schools burning because we have nowhere to learn a fire in the peripheries we've been relegated to queer black bodies spinning on the tip of a candle flame borders incinerated and known who says cattle and bibles and prayer beads and hymn books aflame for those in the coordination and modalities of war and worship who follow the fire and study incineration. It is not alarming at all that the gods have begun to appear at their own places of worship. They step off their gilded thrones, descending on billowy shipskins. They lower themselves, ensconded in light amongst blare and horn of forlorn shrills and toots and booms. They hide themselves in the blaring, repudiating light. It is not alarming the gods are knelt down in supplication at their own altars. It's because the mortals do not believe. The mortals have come up with a word for it. It's called ultra-realism. The mortals only believe when they have a catchphrase. Go, oh, my heart, go to heaven, because there is no peace on earth.
بازی سکوه کابلی آبا تو کلو ما بلیله کابلی The second one is my mom's favorite song. My lullabies are my dad asking for death <laughs> and my mom speaking about the lack of peace. My mom wrote the song in the 1970s She was burying people between Johannesburg and Durban. It was only when it was time to register the song that I realized that she was the composer of the song, but the first time I remember, she forced me and my sister to sing it at a funeral. And until tonight, I didn't realize that I'm actually a funeral singer. In our culture, we have a word for it. Uktutuza. Which in a way is to chaperone in the morning. And this is what the song does. Yesu kusongu yo Asisekwe Klabeni Aba tu bokolo mapelile sabeli ugu. Sikulule, 
translated are the days of peace are no longer the people who profess to peace are no longer the words of peace are no longer the people who profess to peace are no longer release us release us O God of peace release us release us O God of peace Sikulule, 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 oh Sikulule, 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 Sikulule. This last one, second last, is dedicated to grief. If there's anything in my life that has tested my sanity, it's grief. I learned it before adolescence. I lost my dad at 10 years old. I lost my best friend at 29 years old, my little brother. He was my earth. He is one of two people on this planet who understood me clearly. If you're dealing with grief out there, realize something. This earth is, this world is not linear. You'll see them again. You'll see them again. As long as you keep communing with them, lighting candles for them, remembering the good times with them, and doing that thing you used to do with them. There is no end in this experience. It is only there for those who choose it. For those who weren't here earlier, when 
my brother passed, my niece came to me and said, Uncle, are you sad? And I was like, yeah. I was devastated at that time. She said, are you sad because Uncle has died? I was like, yes. And she said to me, my fairies die. And when they die, I don't see them again age of two years old. I'd like to believe that as old as I've grown, that my niece Rudo, whose name means love, was wrong. And that one day when I pass over, my people will all be waiting there for me. <laughs> My little brother will be there. My father will be there. My great grands who I knew nothing about will be there. It's the only thing that really makes sense. I won't lie to you. It's not a wish. It's an understanding that this can't be all it is. To all of you who are dealing with grief right now, it doesn't end. burden you carry. And she said, Uncle, I believe in a thing called love and a thing called life and a ever-growing world. Uncle, I believe in a thing called love and she said, Uncle, I believe in a thing called love and a thing called life and a ever growing world. Uncle, I believe in a thing called love. I will love you forever. If that is what you need Through the good times And the rough times I'll hold your hand through the storm And she said Uncle, I believe in a thing called love And a thing called life in a ever-growing world. Uncle, I believe in a thing called love. And she said, Uncle, I believe in a thing called love and a thing called life in an ever-growing world. Uncle, I believe in a thing called I will love you forever If that is what you need Through the good times And the rough times I hold your hand through these doors
If you want to work out your struggle and be pertinent to what's going on right now, place yourself in the position of black woman. The people most affected by war, women and children. Your identity is meaningless in relation to the poverty we're giving to that space. And y'all are wondering, what is black, right? Is it a race? I, for one, don't believe in A.J. Fervut. And if you don't know that name, keep it that way. Black Black is the opposite to this hegemonic order. Black, black is fighting for the dispossessed. No matter what banner they choose to be under. And don't forget that taxonomy, taxonomy is white. And white's not in race. If you still believe in race, it's 2020. What the hell is your lived experience? Who do you back in your struggle for emancipation? I back the goddess. I back black women. It's black girl magic time. Thank you. Happy birthday. Then it said, finito. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being, being with us for 
the whole day. Thanks, of course, to every single contributor, participant that brought the spirits here. And thanks to the team. Thanks for all this energy. So actually, the program continues. But tomorrow, <laughs> now you're released. <laughs> yes, later at 2.30 p.m. downstairs in the gallery. So stay tuned. Thank you.